move on to a little bit. Um, let's let's do another quick intro. I see some familiar names from yesterday, uh, but I also see a couple of, of new names that maybe weren't here yesterday. So um, if you could introduce yourself in the chat again, um, either rename yourself with your name and organization or just put your name and organization in the chat um, so that we can have a, a better understanding of who all is joining us today. Um, and uh, we, we would appreciate that. I'll give everybody just a minute or so to do so. Hi, Mindy. Welcome, Joe. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Kelly. Perfect. Okay, um, we did see, I did, I do see, recognize a couple of names um, from yesterday. And so um, kind of to, to go ahead and kick us off, uh, I wanted to spend a few minutes just as kind of a recap from, from yesterday. Um, and I wanted to see, oh, hold on, here we are. Yeah, just do a real quick recap. And the main thing I wanted to see is from you. Um, you see on screen a couple of the, the um, notes that we saw, but I would love to hear from someone who was on yesterday about what your takeaway recap was from, from yesterday. Who would like to share? Trisha, anything that was a standout for you from yesterday that you think others might be interested in? Yes, I wanted to be sure I unmuted myself. I'm notorious for talking to myself when I do this. <laughs> yes, I, I really feel that uh, we had some excellent panels giving some great perspectives. I appreciated uh, the opening panel, hearing from uh, school health, uh, PE, nutrition, guidance and counseling, and the fact that a positive from COVID and the pandemic is bringing collaborations together. Mm -hmm. And having worked in a public school district, um, well, 30 some years of my career, I, I, I witnessed the fact that we, a lot of decisions were made standalone for your department. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just thrilled to see the collaborations that have resulted and, and hopefully will sustain in the future because it only makes us stronger. So uh, we did have some excellent panels. I really enjoyed hearing from the students. They were very articulate. You could tell that they, they had put a lot of thought uh, into their role in improving the health and wellness in the campus setting. And so it, it's just good to hear from, well, students and adults that we continue to move forward. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Tricia. Karen. Sorry, I lowered my hand and then I lost the screen. So, <laughs> um, you know, just to kind of reiterate what Tricia said, um, you know, I, I also really appreciate having, again, the data out there to continue to say, look, you know, we're, we're there, there's still some issues out there and using that to show to school districts that, you know, we, we, there's still some work to do. But then on the flip side, yes, those positive takeaways from lessons that we learned from COVID. Um, but just again, directing the districts more to the data. So looking that, you know, it, it truly is the whole child um, when you, you, you're you bringing physical and mental health it, but both into the conversation um, that I think you're starting to see the districts listen more and support it more. 
and hopefully that trajectory is just going in the right direction. So um, just lots of good sharing. I'm really bummed I had to jump off yesterday before the youth yeah. presentation. So I'm looking forward to going back and viewing that on the recording because um, I think it's just, again, super impactful to have their voice in the conversation. Mm -hmm. Good points, good points. Yes, thank you, Karen. Anyone else, please? Good morning. Great. Hi, January. Well, I, I would like to share. I'm a mental health and crisis counselor for Spring Branch ISD, and I thoroughly enjoyed all the the resources that were shared yesterday. In particular, me, you know, my base background being with mental health and with my current role with the district, I really enjoyed that presentation because it allowed me to get some data, you know, to share, bring back to my district as well as great resources that I was able to look up into last night and start collecting, having a database that I will be able to share with my district and the counselors. Wonderful. Thank you, January. Yeah. You're welcome. Anyone else that was on yesterday who might like to share um, a takeaway or? Okay. Well, as he, I'm not going to read to everyone here, but as you can see, just overall, for those of you who might not have attended yesterday, we just wanted to kind of bring back and, and, and just ask and encourage you um, to, to go back and watch the recording. We're so thankful that you're joining us today. Um, and if you weren't able to join us yesterday, please go back and, and review the recordings because we had... Uh, wonderful speakers like Dr. Deanna Helsher that shared those research and trends um, that, that really talked about um, how the work that we're all doing in this realm of school and community um, really is, you know, we're on the right um, trajectory. Um, and, and some of the research that she indicated and shared, you know, demonstrated that, yes, um, we're, we're heading in the right direction. We're not there yet, but we're, we're you know, baby steps, if you will. Um, and then again, yesterday we had a, a wealth, um, as January just noted in her comments, um, quite a few uh, resources and discussions uh, surrounding mental health for everyone from, from students to staff um, and just normalizing that dialogue um, kind of post um, pandemic. Um, the, the silver lining from that, if you will, has been that um, it's something that maybe was taboo as a discussion, you know, years ago, um, that now it's, it's on the forefront and it's okay um, to, to talk about mental health and the need for mental health and the need for self-care and, and um, the, the value in having resources and, and just everyone being able to come along and have that dialogue of, around mental health. Um, and then lastly, um, as several of, of our people just noted, um, it was great to have that youth voice um, because it was apparent, at least to me, um, yesterday, that um, our, our youth are, are amazing future leaders. Um, they, they are all about getting involved um, and, and that us, um, we really should look to seek and survey the youth and, and they want to be a part of the solutions. And so um, it's, it's going to be um, a up to all of us to ensure that we are including um, our youth voice in, in many of our school and community um, efforts um, just uh, related to, to school health. And so again, thank you everyone who joined us yesterday. Um, today coming up, we've got another wonderful morning. We're going to have a couple of panels but before we kick off our panels, um, similar to yesterday, um, we're going to have an expert kind of come on and talk a little bit about where, where we are um, as a state moving forward, sharing a little bit about upcoming um, legislative sessions 
position and um, maybe the role that we all can play in making sure that that our voice is heard. And so um, I want to introduce now uh, Mr. Joel Romo, um, who represents the Cooper Institute and the Partnership for Healthy Texas. Um, and he is a fantastic partner of Texas Action for Healthy Kids. And so, Joel, I'm going to turn things over to you. Well, good morning, and thank you, Alice, for the very kind introduction. I'll pay you later uh, for the kind words. <laughs> um, always enjoy visiting with this group. I'm excited about uh, the coming year in terms of what we have in store for us, the opportunities with legislative policies and regulatory issues, um, but also just excited that uh, you know this organization, Action for Healthy Kids, just has a great uh, momentum behind them, and there's so many um, great folks that are engaged and um, looking forward to harness that excitement and and help not only advance some of these policies at the legislature, but raise awareness about the importance of health and wellness in our children. Um, so as Alice mentioned, I have the opportunity of serving as the legislative chair for the Partnership for Healthy Texas. Um, I have been part of that organization since in its inception in 2006, and I'll go into a little bit about that in a little bit, uh, but also just a little bit more about my background just for, for any of the new folks that may be on, on the call with us today. Um, I have uh, previously, my uh, I got started in this arena was uh, did government relations for the American Heart Association for about 10 years. And then that time I got to know Dr. Kenneth Cooper and went out on my own and, and still to this day, I still have the opportunity to work with the Cooper Institute on their legislative issues and programs. Also get to do some work with American Heart Association from time to time, the American Diabetes and others. So uh, very vested in the issues uh, that we'll be presenting and sharing and advocating, uh, but also uh, always enjoy seeing folks uh, come to the Capitol, meet with our lawmakers, or engage with them at the local level and share our priorities and, and, and talk about the importance and the data that each one of your organizations bring, the programs, and the work that you're doing not only locally, but statewide and federally. Um, so with that being said, um, I did want to give you a little bit of a legislative insight into what will be happening uh, this January 10th when the 88th legislature convenes. And uh, hard to believe, we, you know, we're less than two months away from the next legislative session. So what does that mean? Um, that means uh, bills are already being filed. The first day to file bills was this past Monday. Uh, in that first day, over 800 pieces of legislation were already filed between both the House and the Senate. Um, historically, throughout a legislative session, there's over 7,000 pieces of legislation filed. Um, you know, maybe 800, 1,000 of them make them to the governor's desk. So as you can see, that um, a lot of the, uh, deliberation takes place when these bills are filed. Um, uh, a little bit more into the insight of the legislature coming up in January when they do get sworn in on January 10th. Uh, not much change in the makeup of the House. Majority of the Republican Party will have a majority of the House members, a little over 82, 83 members uh, of the 150. And then the Texas Senate, same, there'll be about 19, I believe, uh, um, excuse me, 21 uh, senators, uh, Republican out of the 31. So uh, not much changed in the makeup of both bodies, nor at the leadership level. We still will uh, come January, the governor, lieutenant governor, and uh, we expect the Speaker of the House today to feed in to maintain his position as Speaker. So uh, we kind of know the, the leadership. Um, we know the issues that uh, are going to be priority this session for, for the leadership, and those are going to be the following. Those are going to be obviously school safety uh, and behavioral health. Um, given all the things happening and that have happened in our public schools from Uvalde and other items. There also will be a lot of focus on the grid. There will also be a lot of ish focus on state border and, and security. There will also be a lot of discussions on what are we going to do with a $26 billion surplus that's in the state of Texas rainy day fund. Um, and so with that being said, I know many organizations are already prioritizing the budgetary ask of the legislature, everything from some nutrition policies to um, some, some safe route to school initiatives, 
but we're that's just uh, what we know of. You know, I think it's safe to say of the $26 billion surplus that is there, you could see probably $60 billion in requests come to the legislature. So everybody needs to get uh, their request in early. Everybody needs to engage your grassroots and advocacy efforts uh, to get the support for those issues. Um, but again, that's one another of the, of the big key issues that'll be um, debated this session. Uh, and again, as I mentioned earlier, behavioral health is going to really take the forefront on a lot of issues this session. And um, so there's opportunities there for us in all those arenas. We just have to be creative and utilize our expertise, which are the folks here on this call from your organizations. How do we weave into these different priorities, high level priorities? Uh, to advance policies that to help our children stay healthy, uh, both physically and emotionally. Um, so from the Partnership for Healthy Texas, we have been working throughout the last year at preparing for the session uh, and developing our legislative agenda. Um, we've been meeting with stakeholders. We've been organ you know, administratively getting organized. Um, so let me start a little bit. I'm going to share my screen and um, share my PowerPoint and um, I will, um, let me make sure we do this correct here. Um, let's see here. Pardon me, here we go. Um, so um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the Partnership for Healthy Texas, we've already developed our legislative agenda our priorities, we'll go into that in a minute, uh, but a little bit about who we are. Um, our mission has been to develop and promote state policies that prom that um, protect and address obesity and that, that promote and address, oh, excuse me, I am uh, prevent and address obesity. Texas can't speak this morning, haven't had much coffee yet. Um, and so we go about this in a different way. We find out, you know, what works for Texans. We look at the priorities that our other organizations that are part of the coalition bring to the table. We assess the, play, the, the legislative land or the legislative uh, field at the Capitol and at the state agencies and, and just figure out, you know, what's going to work. How are we going to make these issues, you know, ad advance and get support? And through the five months of legislative session, we as, as a coalition work to to advance those issues, track those issues, uh, other bills that may come up. Uh, we play a lot of defense on, on programs that we have been successful in implementing since 2006 that we need to protect and preserve to ensure that as we follow through on our mission of promoting, uh, of preventing and addressing obesity in Texas, that we uh, go got, approach this in a globally uh, perspective. Um, our organization is made up of you know just uh, numerous wonderful uh, co uh, coalition partners. Everybody, as you can see on the screen, uh, from Healthy Living Matters, TAFER, Texas Pediatric Society, Action for Healthy Kids, Feeding Texas, et cetera, goes on and on. Um, we're very proud of this membership and this, this roster of, of great partners uh, and, and all the resources they bring to us uh, during not only during the session, but during the interim. We also have a couple other coalition partners, that being our friends at Live Smart Texas, that this group is very familiar with, as well as the Texas Public Health Coalition. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with that coalition, that is a coalition that's uh, probably also about, I'd say maybe 10 years old, a little, a little longer, um, led by the Texas Medical Association and, and our the great partners there. Focuses a little bit more on a little bit, the whole public health spectrum, everything from immunizations, cancer prevention, um, chronic disease, uh, tobacco, um, and, and just, you know, we, you know, great about being able to pivot and address public health issues that are front and center to our state. And then our educational resources, these are the folks that really um, help us um, have some great tools in our tool shed uh, that we can share with our partners. And that's the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living. And our friends at MD Anderson Cancer Center, <clears throat> excuse me, these folks have not only great data, um, one pagers, especially the, the child obesity reports from the, <coughs> excuse me, Michael and Susan Dell Center, 
but just the resources as well in terms of you know what MJ Anderson can bring to the table and uh, physicians and great resources in terms of tobacco prevention, obesity, and, and cancer prevention. So um, Partnership for Healthy Texas is very appreciative of all these folks. And one of the partners I did not mention was Methodist Healthcare Ministries. They have been very supportive of the coalition to helping us um, financially support our, our, our staff to kind of oversee the coalition as well as provide us the tools that we need sometimes to provide some legislative briefings and resources that we may not otherwise have. So many thanks to our partners at uh, Methodist Healthcare Ministries. A um, little bit of our history. I mentioned that, you know, I was one of the founding member members. So we did in 2006, when the coalition, a uh, little bit of history of how this came about, and it's always a fun story. I just began my work with the American Heart Association, um, and come of the, some of the partners all reached out, folks from the Texas Pediatric Society at the time, Texas Medical Association, Cancer Society, uh, Texas PTA, Tafer, and others um, got together and wanted to figure out um, how can we work together to get some policies regarding the childhood obesity issue um, get through the finish line at the Texas Capitol. Um, everybody was working on their own initiative and lawmakers were divided on, you know, there's only so many votes they can cast on, the, on, on some of these issues. Um, there's only so many regulatory bills they can get agents, you know, agencies to embrace. There's only so much funding to go around. Uh, we've got to work together to get something done. And so literally at a initial meeting at a car at a Starbucks coffee table after, and then months of building um, not everything from bylaws to the infrastructure, um, the partnership with Healthy Texas uh, was born and since then has been very um, successful in their efforts. Uh, it brought together a wide coalition of research experts, stakeholders, advocates, all committed to addressing obesity through evidence-based policies. Uh, we are the only statewide policy coalition dedicated to primarily fighting to end obesity in Texas. Um, some of our historical accomplishments include increasing the physical activity minutes in our schools, as well as the establishment of what is fitness gram and, and uh, that is used as our fitness, physical fitness assessments in, in public schools today. In addition to that was a passage of funding for evidence-based obesity prevention initiatives at the State Department of Health Services. Um, one that we're really proud of is updating the child care standards related to nutrition, screen time, and physical activity in, 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 our, in our child care facilities, and recently engaging more in SNAP issues, addressing senior citizens and, and the hungers among our senior citizens. And um, these are just some of our historical accomplishments. We have numerous others that we've been able to uh, advance. We have played some great defense thanks to, to this coalition Whenever the flag is raised, there's there's help needed. The capital, this coalition has, and and everybody on this call has been great about getting emails, phone calls uh, to their lawmakers to to address, you know, to to fund to fend off efforts to weaken PE or the physical fitness assessments or school health advisory councils. Have we been successful every time? No. Um, there has been some times that we've had to. Um, there's greater powers that just had to address some policies in terms of shacks or other things that, you know, I, I, I don't want to sound um, sarcastic, sarcastic, but, you know, had we not been there, it could have been worse uh, in terms of some of the things that have happened on some of these policies. Uh, but now what, you know, many thanks to Michelle Smith and her efforts to raise awareness about the importance of our school health advisory councils and the work creating that kind of uh, pocket of leadership uh, for this upcoming session, because I think there is a need to raise awareness about the importance of those programs, all the things done at, at SHACs and all, you know, I'll get into a little bit more in a bit in, in our legislative priorities, but there is going to be a big effort for this coalition or big, it'll be a big priority for this coalition to play defense on a number of things that are dear to everyone on this call. Um, so um, with that, let me just also give um, recognition to what recognition is due. Our chair of our coalition is Dr. David Lakey, um, uh, vice chancellor of uh, UT School of Public Health. Um, also um, tra uh, Clayton Travis with the Texas Pediatric Society. Um, is one of our is 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 you know, one of our co-chairs and 
We appreciate their leadership on, on this coalition and, and, and keeping us not only focused on sound policy and science, but leading uh, and directing the coalition uh, during the interim and during the session. Uh, there's a lot of work that went into developing these legislative priorities. Um, we just had a legislative briefing at the Texas Capitol yesterday as we prepare for the upcoming session. Uh, good turnout of lawmaker uh, staff and partners uh, that we you know, are unveiled the, these priorities that we developed. So how I'm gonna share these is basically look at, look at the priorities in three buckets. Uh, obviously food security, um, well-rounded education and infrastructure in our schools, uh, and a little bit of focus on Medicaid opportunities to incorporate some ev ev evidence-based treatments and healthy food interventions. Um, you'll see on this slide, you know, the, those buckets have some of the priorities under each of those, and I'm going to uh, dive a little deeper into those issues, everything from SNAP to PE to safe routes to the Medicaid weight management items uh, for us to, so for you to learn a little bit more about as we go through the uh, presentation. So um, on this one, the modernizing the SNAP vehicle asset test, uh, it prevents thousands of hungry families from accessing food assistance for several reasons. It's a program that's outdated. It disproportionately harms uh, Black and Latino households, especially two-parent and multi-generational households. Um, it jeopardizes people's ability to work, as well it harms families when, when inflation is high. Um, what's the solution? Well, that's what this policy proposal is about. It's to modernize the SNAP vehicle asset test by applying an infl inflationary adjustment to the current limits. Uh, as you can see here, our partners at Feeding Texas will be leading this policy initiative. They're already identifying some, some lawmakers um, at, to take the lead, as well as stakeholders that can help drive the change. And, and you know, this is one of the uh, areas that uh, the partners that brought us this policy and, and, the, and the steering committee, the legislative committee have adopted this as one of the priorities. Um, another area that also Feeding Texas is helping us lead the effort on will be the redu reducing of hunger at community colleges. Uh, excuse me. Uh, we know college tuition costs are, are rising um, with the current inflation in our country. We also know with that, that means the cost of housing, food, and the other necessities of our students are increasing. So uh, the inability to afford basic needs uh, uh, is one of the many reasons that our community college students see uh, an increase in, in poor nutrition uh, or as well as not completing their education. So they have to make some decisions. Um, our federal regulations severely limit the access to SNAP for college students, uh, and to, especially those attending more than half time. So that's a challenge. Uh, at a time that we're trying to ensure our, our youth are going through the workforce and getting, whether it be a trade or, 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 or academic background, uh, we feel it is important that um, you know, our, our, our students um, have the access to healthy food. So the legislative solution is that the Health and Human Service Commission should identify college degree programs that are vocational or technical in, in nature so that students enroll in these programs can receive the SNAP benefits. Um, so, you know, that's again, an effort that will be led by our friends at Feeding Texas and a legislative priority that um, hopefully many of you can help support and put in your legislative agendas if you have not had, or if you're still working on developing your legislative agenda. And then next um, we have um, Food Bucks, the Double Up Food Bucks Initiative, a Snappy Healthy Food Initiative Program. Um, we're right now we're looking to appropriate at least 5 million to Health and Human Service Commission to implement a SNAP incentive program that allows retail retailers to offer matching incentives to SNAP recipients who use their benefits to purchase healthy fruits and vegetables. Um, this initiative will be uh, led by the Sustainable Food Center and the American Heart Association. As you can see here, uh, they're making a legislative request of 5 million to the Texas legislature and remember, um, I said there was about $26 billion, so there's $5 million right there that's going to be requested of the $26 billion. Um, so you're $5 million into that. Uh, this is just on health and obesity initiatives, so I'm sure other groups um, have some great budgetary requests, but again, the pot is only so big and lawmakers are only going to divvy out. Uh, they may not divvy out any of that $26 billion. They may feel it's um, priority to save that money what it's intended for, which is a rainy day. 
uh, but I'm getting off subject there, but just kind of giving you, this gives you a highlight of, okay, so all these people asking for money, uh, here we are, the Partnership for Healthy Texas will be pushing and supporting an initiative for 5 million to the Health and Human Service Commission for SNAP incentive programs for the double up food bucks. So again, um, we'll be advocating for this. And I know as uh, the two organizations working on this, we're looking at identifying lawmakers to help lead these efforts uh, and get the initiatives going in, in this coming session. Um, but here's one that I know is dear to everybody on this call. Not that any others aren't, but I know that everybody on this call, I'm speaking to the choir when we know the benefits of having kids stay physically active. We have plenty of data that demonstrates the correlation between um, less absenteeism, increase in um, academic performance, uh, less chronic disease, cost savings when students are healthier. Um, parents aren't missing work as much, obviously, when they're not transporting their children to and from doctor's appointments because as students stay healthier or more physically active, um, you know, we, we see the benefits, and especially as re, as result of the past pandemic, we have seen, an, unfortunately, an increase in obesity. Um, and, and we saw a lot of easement on physical activity requirements in schools. So um, while these three bullets here are generic, um, we do see opportunities, we see challenges. And let me go into a little bit of that. So as this everybody knows, we have advocated for the school districts to implement some type of recess policies that's uh, comprehensive across the state of Texas. We've had some great success of getting that bill passed all the way up to the governor's office. First time it got vetoed, it was guilt by association. One of our sponsors, legislative sponsors, um, took out a little bit of, uh, um, let's just say, didn't respond to one of the governor's requests and uh, appropriately. So therefore, the governor vetoed the bill simply because that senator had his name on this bill. So uh, we got it moving again last session. Uh, then we ran into a little interpersonal fight between our house sponsor and the chair of the house committee and the house public ed committee and the bill got stalled. Um, and again, it didn't have anything to do with the policy itself. It was more as the personalities. Uh, we are working with partners to see, you know, how who will be leading this bill for the coalition uh, this coming session. Um, we'll rebuild the the leadership, the, the advocacy group, advocacy folks behind it again, uh, and we hope to get it all the way to the finish line and signed by the governor this year. Protecting and restoring PE and health education in our middle and high schools. Uh, as everybody is familiar, health is no longer an ed a requirement for graduation in high schools. Uh, over the years, we've seen PE requirements scaled back um, and many waivers. Um, we've seen an increase in waivers for PE. We are trying to get legislation to restore that health education requirement. Uh, in working with all the partners, some of the arguments we hear, not arguments, but more of this justification for that is, obviously we want school children to learn healthy habits so that when they graduate, they know the importance of eating healthy, staying physically fit, the emotional health, uh, behavioral health issues that are benefits of that. Um, what we also know is this is kind of where everybody gets dumped and all these programs get dumped into health education, but now there's not a requirement for health education. Um, so all the programs that the legislature has mandated um, in terms of the PAPA program, CPR, et cetera, uh, folks have to get creative and figure out where to put those since health education is not required. We see the benefits for, for having health as a graduation requirement. We all know the benefits of increasing PE minutes and restoring what we've lost. We do have some challenges given the, the number of minutes in a day, administrators that may feel this is gonna take away from other programs and, and the fine arts individuals and, act, and athletics. So um, we do see some opportunities in what, visiting with our friends at Tapered and others. There, there may be other PE related opportunities, ensuring that um, uh, some programs or, or, or graduation routes are not penalized for kids that take PE. Um, there may be some areas that uh, we can see PE being a benefit for behavioral health. Um, so we are looking at what these proposals may look like, and, and we'll be filing some bills on these over the coming, in the coming weeks. 
uh, and we'll need everybody's help, but we also are going to have to play defense just to simply keep what we have in the books. Uh, lawmakers always like to scale back. Uh, and, and that leads me into this next one in terms of requiring the physical fitness assessments in public schools. Um, my understanding that, uh, uh, you know, the, during the pandemic, uh, the physical fitness assessments for requirements were waived. Uh, we haven't seen that in this last year. It's my understanding there'll be uh, Texas Education Agency, if they already haven't, will soon be uh, releasing, you know, the physical fitness assessment um, guidelines for, for, for the next school year. Um, and the software, and we know the data that can be collected from this will only benefit us in terms of proving the correlation between uh, academic performance and staying physically fit. Uh, as Dr. Cooper always says, you know, uh, exercise is medicine, and, and we need we can prove that with this data. So um, this is one of those areas of issues that always gets caught of. When lawmakers are looking to scale back any type of requirements of screenings, et cetera, in public schools, uh, the physical fitness assessment sometimes makes it to the top of the list. Um, we do see you know, now with uh, Jay Nelson no longer in the Texas Senate, uh, we have cultivated uh, partners, uh, other senators to be supportive of this issue, but it's not going to be easy um, if, if there is an initiative to, to remove this requirement. And with that, we also are getting um you know intel from our just uh, just other government relations folks in the field that there will be a move with the vaccination debate to maybe to ease restriction ease requirements on everything from what school health advisory councils report and do but also um the vision and screening the vision and, and hearing screenings that take place in public schools you know maybe making them an opportunity for parents to opt out of those uh, th this is just kind of where we get um, those of us in this field stay up at night worrying about the amendments that may come up or last minute committee changes and bills um, that will remove what we have in place already. So the importance of raising awareness, sharing the data, telling the story about why your schools or your organizations or your uh success stories can help us preserve what we have in place and maybe strengthen it a little bit so this will be uh obviously the partnership for health of texas has been longtime advocates of more pe more physical fitness um and, and we will continue to doing so but just give you an idea of what we're looking to advance but also play defense um let's move into some of the areas that we're moving into and and i talked to you about some of the medicaid area um, right now, we're looking at free care rule reversal, um, CMS Medicaid free care guidance schools. We're allowed to bill for Medicaid only if students enroll Medicaid, et cetera, health care services related to their IEPs. Um, what we're looking at, some challenges that opportunities for some of these revers reversals in the Medicaid world is allowing schools to request reimbursement for all services to all students enrolled in Medicaid, whether they're not in the IEP or not. So, you know, this is, a, a, you know, one of the, the areas that were uh, new areas for the partnership, but we've got some great partners that will be looking and advancing this. Um, what schools, districts can build Medicaid for everything from behavioral mental health services, audio, audiology, speech, pathology, nursing, administrative services, uh, broad, broad health services, including, as I mentioned, the vision, the hearing, and other screenings. So we do see some opportunities there for playing in there, and I say playing in the arena of Medicaid. This is a new arena for the Partnership for Healthy Texas. We've got some great new uh, partners at the coalition that, you know, these issues will not only help not address the behavioral health, but also the obesity related issues and uh, that uh, can be addressed through other ways through Medicaid. And, um, you know, in a bit we'll go give you the opportunity to kind of how you can dig deep uh, get more in-depth information on these issues. Um, and then, you know, students, you know, how they can be eligible, obviously 20 years or older, uh, they can pay for the school-based physical mental health services uh, and services covered by state Medicaid program and de delivered by a qualified provider. Um, and so these are some of the reasons why Texas should implement the free care re reversal. You know, it's a sustainable source of federal funding, increased school budget flexibility, increases academic attendance, academic outcomes, health disparities are reduced. 
relieving schools' budgets, um, so many of the services they already are providing. So it's a win-win for everybody if we can get this done. So, you know, this will most likely be a little bit of a budgetary issue as well as some policy that will be advanced this session. Um, so there's an opportunity to take advantage of these federal dollars. Um, and we're looking at different buckets of money in terms of the Safer Communities Act. Um, so we, we see the financial impact of expanding this Medicaid program and other, that has been beneficial in other states. We're hoping to bring that to Texas. Um, 17 states have implemented such a program and four in the process of doing so. We hope to join that map uh, during this 88th legislative session. Um, and there are some additional sources and all this that uh, we'll be able to share this PowerPoint with you that you can, uh, for those of you that may want to dig a little bit deeper into this issue and may look at ways to support it from your organizations, uh, this is an opportunity for getting more information and seeing where this may impact your programs or how you can support it. Um, and then from our folks at the Bike Texas, we have our safe, right, safe routes to school, some of their priorities We'll be promoting accessible paths for K-12 students to get to and from school by foot or on bike through some of their state and federal level, level funding. That's uh, uh, infrastructure improvements and non-infrastructure activity funding. Um, they'll be asking for the state to invest in the Safe Route School program by staffing the program with a full-time coordinator and their biannual strategic plans. They'll be looking at utilizing funding available through the bipartisan infrastructure law to invest maximum allowable highway safety improvement funds in, in the safe route school infrastructure and non-infrastructure projects and education. So um, I know Robin and his team are working on more specific language. Uh, these are, are easy wins um, given the new funding that is coming down from, from presidential and from, from the White House. Uh, there are some numerous dollars that will be uh, distributed through the state agencies. Uh, so we foresee that this will be um, some funding opportunities as well as some policy. I know Robert and his team are already identifying some, some champions on this issue and we'll be looking forward to working with them on that. Um, and then back to some of the coverage for obesity treatment and Medicaid, you know, as everybody knows, you know, BC is such a complex and complex issue. And, what we're looking for is, you know, are there any opportunities for clinical options to help us? Um, uh, there are many ways to do this. However, the weight management interventions are not covered covered by by obesity in Texas Med covered for the diagnosis. Excuse, excuse me, diagnosis of obesity in Texas Medicaid. So, what we're looking to is to expand that coverage for the coverage of obesity treatment and Medicaid in Texas. Um, we have the data that demonstrates, you know, the preventions and the, and the proactive treatments that could happen uh, that can help guide the, those patients uh, into a healthier lifestyle and the cost savings that could come as a result of it, not only to the patient and their families, but to the state of Texas and the U.S. government. Um, so working on what those policies may look like, there's been a lot of discussions at the legislature during the House Select Committee on Health Care Reform. Um, this interim on, on different ways to address obesity. And we look forward to addressing some of this with that work group. And another key issue that has come out of the uh, Chairman Harless's uh, Select Committee on Healthcare Reform is food as medicine. A lot of conversations in those hearings about, you know, folks, you know, just basically them saying food is medicine. Uh, the type of food you can eat can obviously help you lead a healthier, lifestyle. Um, so we're looking at working with these lawmakers as they've had these interim hearings that they've come out in support of some type of food as medicine uh, policy or, or, or program. Um, you know, we're looking at adopting a statewide policy framework to integrate the clinical and community services that are out there. You know, we know that the problem that exists right now is food, healthy food access, uh, then the chronic disease that comes with it and the healthcare costs that are also associated. We know that many Medicaid MCOs have pilot programs to provide services that are not formal Medicaid benefits, uh, which includes food as medicine programs, but they do not get credit for these activities when rates are set. So therefore, the Partnership for Healthy Texas with our partners' recommendation is to support the adoption of a statewide policy framework to better integrate clinical and community services to improve access to healthy foods. And again, 
Uh, I know um, Clayton from Texas Pediatric Society and others are looking at how this is what this policy will look like. They've been meeting with some lawmakers on, on you know, uh, cultivating some champions. And we, the partnership, will keep everybody informed on the progress. And as these are specific uh, initiatives are followed, you know, what those will look like. So let me get to what where we are. So we see that um, we have um, legislative white pages available online. And all those are, um, we can download those to to your um, and, and to your use. You can use these to uh, share with lawmakers as you do your visits to uh, get more information about all these issues and what's taking place. Um, you can uh, put these hopefully in your package when you do your capital days and help us advance some of these issues. Let us know if you'd like to join, um, you know, uh, support some of these issues. Um, we are looking at um, expanding, uh, you know, the, the network of support that we have for our policy initiatives. All these white papers were developed by the Partnership for Healthy Texas. Our stakeholders uh, were vetted, were researched for uh, clarity, uh, data, uh, et cetera, that we, we put together. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, this is kind of what we've designed this to be a one stop shop for our lawmakers uh, so they can you know, not have to click around to all the different groups and find out what they're working on in terms of obesity. This way, they can come to the Partnership for Healthy Texas and voila, here you have the priorities that are supported by our coalition of, of so many great partners. Also, before I go to questions, I, I would like to say, so we are still, as, I, as you heard just now, developing our legislative champions for not only the budgetary issues, but the legislative policies. Um, you'll see that as our newsletters go out, you'll see uh, progress reports on you know bills that are being filed that partnership is pushing and our champions and that we need to rally around them. We'll also keep you posted during the session, as I mentioned earlier, on issues that we need to engage in and be, you know, prevent from reaching the floor if they're harmful to any things that we've done in the past. Um, we also um, will probably work with our partners in terms of uh, joint, you know, jumping in where we can to provide that set of briefings. If you're interested in joining the Partnership for Healthy Texas or you already are a member of the Partnership for Healthy Texas, we will have standing Thursday legislative meetings, 10 a.m. in the Capitol. Uh, I think we're going to start those maybe the January 12th. I'm not certain, uh, but we all historically have always had a standing legislative meeting in the Capitol that Thursday every week um, to get kind of where we are with our bills, what do we need to prepare for next week? Who's got capital days coming up? How can we help our partners and advance their initiatives? What do we need to do to raise awareness? Who do we need to go see in the capital? Um, and so if you'd like to join any of those, feel free to reach out to me um, and we can get you engaged. Um, we also, if you do have a capital day and want us to speak at one of those or would like some more information from our coalition, reach out to us. We're happy to join with you or uh, come in and present uh, if you're having a briefing or just educating your advocates. Um, and we also are, you know, we've got plenty of resources. So please, you know, we're here to help you not reinvent the wheel. Um, and if you're doing any in district visits before the session begins, let us know. We're happy to join you. Or if you want to use this information and just kind of want a little bit of, you know, hey, how do I sell this to this lawmaker in East Texas or South Texas? Um, we, the Partnership for Healthy Texas, are more than happy to spend a little bit of time and bringing you up to speed and helping um, you kind of navigate the waters as you advance and get ready for the upcoming session. With that, I'll stop and see if there are any questions. Okay, questions. Either feel free to unmute your mic or drop them into the chat box. Um, I have a quick question. 
Go ahead, John. Uh, uh, Joel, so what's the status with, with Fitnessgram moving forward? We haven't had access to that system for quite some time now. And, and this happens you know, every year that contract comes up for renewal. It seems like we have access to being, we have problems accessing the system. Is, is that going to continue? Or what, what's your take on that? Because it, it, it's, it's really quite you know, cumbersome for us. The district level, we have this requirement to test kids, but yet the database isn't available and we have to find other ways to do that. Do you, are, 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 is there any support for getting that rectified moving forward? Well, uh, thank you for the question. I've received that a few times. If it were up to folks such as the Cooper Institute to rectify that, we would. It's more of a state agency issue. Cool. Yes, uh, and, and so contract wise, I, I know uh, just to complete transparency, Fitnessgram is now owned by Greenlight Credentials. They own the Fitnessgram software. So they are the vendor for Fitnessgram. The Cooper Institute is no longer the vendor. It is my understanding that the uh, selection has been made for the tool to that will be used for the next school year and that all that should be rolling out very soon and there no, will be no change in software. Um, now, could there be some type of legislative requirement to make the agency coordinate when those contracts are executed with the school year? I'd, I'd love to see it happen. Could it be done? Um, we could, you know, certainly probably would support that. It's just a matter of whether or not which lawmakers would. I'm sure there's numerous other contracts not related to this that are probably done mid year. Um, you know, if there's a way to coordinate that, you know, that we'll be happy to jump on board and make sure, because I know it's a burden for for the folks that have to enter the data and use a program to have to either hurry up and enter it all in at one time or forego it for the year because they get the approval for the software too late in the game. Exactly. So I, I understand completely, if I had a magic wand, we'd love to fix it. Um, it would probably take a, either a, a legislative fix or a state agency fix. And, uh, and if any of our TEA friends are on the call, I do not mean this disrespectfully, but I know TEA is very shorthanded in the terms of the area of health and wellness. When the good old days, when they had at least six to eight people, I think we're down to half an FTE that runs that whole department for the state of Texas. Okay, well, thank you. I'll be happy to work on it or champion if I can. Yeah, please, please, because, you know, I mean, it, it just, it really does make things difficult for us and, and really for our teachers, because they're the ones who have to gather this data and then hold on to it, you know, and sometimes, you know, they're, they're taking the data down on paper and then transferring the system when it would be so much easier for them just to be able to do it directly into the system. And so, you know, we're asking them to do twice the work and it's just, you know, it does become a problem. It's very frustrating for them. I understand. Thank you. Thank you for the question, John, and, and the comments. And again, um, it's it's important for all of these sorts of uh, concerns to be uh, brought to light. And, and Joel certainly is someone who um, can benefit from hearing um, and, and can, you know, do what he can in, in part, certainly when it comes to writing in or supporting um, some of that, which uh, related to the fitness gram. Um, do we have any other questions? You did such a good job, Joel. You covered well, it all. Well, thank you. I do want to say, though, um, one of the other things that we're excited about this um, session is that we will be back in the building. Um, we're going to start off the session already. I mean, it's already was up there yesterday morning. Uh, the building's busy again. Uh, things are back to normal. Uh, I know last session, uh, there weren't, the public was not allowed to go into the building until very late in the session. And then there's no capital days. Uh, it's great to see folks having scheduling their capital days. It's great to see groups already making the rounds. Again, if you are interested in, in hosting one or looking at having one, we're happy to help. Um, we'll keep you posted on what we do with the Partnership for Healthy Texas. I know the Michael and Susan Dell Center will probably do another briefing, I believe, with the Capitol. I don't want to speak out of turn, 
Um, but we we look forward to working with them. And and you know, if 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 I can be on a panel with Dr. Steve Kelder one day, you'd make that be on my bucket list. So <laughs> it's been a long time, Joel. It's been a long good. time. It's good, good to, to see, see you. you. Me too. Um, I might mention, I remember when I first started working here in Texas, I think Tommy Fleming had a, a department of uh, 15 people at TEA. Um, <laughs> and I think it's down to one now. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe that's maybe that should be an agenda item on her. It could for be. Somebody, for somebody. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, thank you, um, Steve and, and Joel. Um, we are um coming right up against uh oh almost 10 o'clock or so um if we have no other questions for joel want to say thank you joel for coming to provide us an update again on uh partnership and our legislative uh, priorities moving forward, and uh, we'll have Joel's in contact information um, also available to everybody um, in our follow-up emails. Thank you, Joel. Thank you all. You have a great day. Mm -hmm. Okay. And our next presentation, um, we actually have just a few minutes before. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kelder, for, for joining us uh, today. Um, we are going to give everybody a little stand-up break, I think, because we, uh, we've been going here for the last hour, hour and a half, and I think everybody needs a little time to go refresh coffee um, and uh, uh, just grab some more water. Um, if that's okay with you, Dr. Kelder, we have you down kicking off here just, uh, just around 10, 10 five, yep. I think. Perfect. Sounds good. You know, I think I need a cup of coffee too. <laughs> okay. So everyone, uh, you can just, just take the next few minutes, take a little walk, um, grab some, some more coffee and we will be back shortly. Okay. See everyone back uh, right at around 10 o'clock or so to start checking mics.
There you are, Priscilla. Hello. Hey there. <laughs> Lessons learned. <laughs> well, we're better at this technology than two years ago, that's for sure. That is for sure. And everyone else is too. And yeah. I was able to get back into the meeting. And so I made a, a couple small edits to the presentation between okay. yesterday and, and one is that um, I, I added back in the seventh and eighth grade schedule slides. You, we might be run out of time by then, but I thought it, it was nice to show an illustration of you know, when we're thinking about what would be the ideal time to do these different elements. Okay. Okay, awesome. So who are you training today? We're doing the, the train the trainers um, and this is our day two. Um, so I was just running through all of our supplementals today since it's our day two. Mm -hmm. I said, I, I'll be back. And I I left the meeting, but it ended it since I was the host. So yeah. uh, <laughs> we uh -oh. all <laughs> Well, it looks like you need to get another computer. There you go. I just need to have like a separate laptop for I, I actually do that. I, I use my iPad quite a bit in those situations. But, oh. um, you know, we have um, we have loaners uh, that Randy can get you if you want. OK, yeah, I might have to might have to bother him for some help for something. <laughs> um, all right. So will you share your screen, Dr. Kelder? Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Let me get that set up. You have the more updated version. <laughs> There it is. There we go. Can you see that, Priscilla? Yes, I can. Perfect. Thanks so much, Dr. Kelder. Uh, we will be kicking off. We're going to give everybody just another minute or two to sure. uh, possibly join on. Oh, here's somebody else coming in. So I'll still letting in a couple of people that are joining. Um, lots of interest in this session. So. Well, good. That's nice. Yeah. I'm not sure we've met, Alice. Have we met somewhere? Oh, along yeah. The way? Oh, yeah. We have. When did we meet? <laughs> I'm just getting old and I can't remember stuff anymore. <laughs> uh, no. uh, a number of times uh, in Sorry. in Austin over um, probably back when we were still doing our um, health champion awards over at um, um, uh, like the AT&T conference centers or oh. we've met. Um, I've been on a couple of Deanna's uh, committees and projects. Yeah, come I figured come you us. probably know Deanna and, and Sandra Evans pretty well. Mm -hmm. Alini yeah, too. Sandra, Sandra, and Carolyn. Yeah, and mm -hmm. Alini. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. They all have worked on our Texas Grow Eat Go projects and mm -hmm. so forth. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Absolutely. Well, I, I have swerved into e-cigarettes now, so I don't I don't get to see the old crew the same way. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, but, uh, and I'm glad you have swerved into e-cigarettes because this is definitely this and, um, you know, all of the vaping has just really, yeah. And yesterday that came up a couple of times in discussion as well in, in our session yesterday. So, yeah. Okay. Well, hopefully that can be helpful. Uh, I know you will be. <laughs> okay, everyone. Let's go ahead and um, 
get started, I would um, like to introduce Dr. Steve Kelder, um, who is professor, as you can see here on his um, title slide, uh, epidemiology, human genetics, uh, environmental sciences, and he is at UT School of Public Health in Austin. Um, and then also Ms. Priscilla Garza, who will also be co-presenting. Um, and we're so thankful to have both of you here today um, to share a little bit about um, what is going on with e-cigarettes and vaping. Um, and thank you for joining our Action for Healthy Kids conference um, today. And so I will continue letting some people in. I, I see a few more that are joining us. But if y'all would like to, um, if you don't mind, Dr. Kelder, um, giving just a little intro about your background also, that would be helpful. Sure. Well, thank you very much, Alice. <clears throat> and good to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> feel like a jerk now. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so thanks for inviting me to come and, and speak to you guys. So um, today we're going to talk about e-cigarettes. I'm going to talk about uh, wh where the research is for the epidemiology of e-cigarettes. Uh, and then uh, Priscilla Garza is going to talk about a program that we work together on called Catch My Breath. I, I thought that might be of interest to sort of summarize what's going on with e-cigarettes from my end. Uh, and then Priscilla talking about what it's like in the field. Um, and uh, you may or may not know this, but uh, Priscilla is a, a student at our campus here and is working uh, closely with uh, the group at Catch Global Foundation in implementing Catch My Breath. And so in fact, she just left a training this morning and she's doing a train the trainer system. And so she knows a, a lot about how to train schools and, and, and what schools are doing with this topic. Uh, my own background is uh, uh, I've, I've worked in a number of areas. I, I call myself a child and adolescent health um, researcher and practitioner. And so I've worked in injury and violence and HIV, STD, alcohol, uh, obesity, diet, physical activity, and most recently in uh, e-cigarettes. So uh, I've got a fair number of slides. So let's uh, just move forward if that's okay. And so I'm assuming that a number of you are obesity researchers because that, that's been the history, I think, of Action for Healthy Pet, of, of, of your organization. So I'm just going to cover a couple of the basics. And so if you look all the way to the left, 1975, I was in high school. And uh, the, the smoking rate for high school seniors was a little over 35%. I graduated in 76 where it, it, got, it went up to almost 40%. So just imagine if 40% of the high school kids that you know, um, high school seniors uh, were, were current smokers. In fact, we had a smoking lounge in my high school just for students. There's another one for teachers too. Um, and so one of the success stories that we talk about, whoops, one of the success stories we, eh, one of the, I touched the wrong button. One of the success stories we talk about in public health is, is this decline. And so you can see it went down, stayed flat for a long time, and then it started going up. Uh, and, and part of the reason for the upward slope up until 97 was, was a, a shift in the way that uh, tobacco products were marketed, uh, going into discounting. But then you see the real public health work happening from 97 all the way down to 2021. And so some of us who are in the tobacco control field are saying, well, you know, maybe we've licked prevention with kids. Um, but then e-cigarettes came along and e-cigarettes were introduced in the marketplace, uh, I think around 2011. Uh, and so this is data that was just published last, I think this week, even from Stan Glantz, who's an advocate for tobacco control and has for his entire career. But, but here we see as time goes on, we're seeing that um, the first product that's used by adolescents uh, is now very high uh, up at uh, e-cigarettes or what kids are using and, and, and regular cigarettes are, are declining rapidly. So this mirrors what I just showed you. Kids are not using regular combustible cigarettes so much. Uh, they're using e-cigarettes instead. And the problem with that, in my view, is that uh, e-cigarettes have nicotine. And when you use nicotine, you have a propensity to become addicted and you also have trouble Quitting because of withdrawal. And you know, I'm not going to get into this slide very deep at all, just to say that there's a number of genes which uh, regulate the effect of nicotine on your body. Um, and they, they have to do with the pleasure and reward center. If you look on the left hand, yellow is dopamine. 
Uh, and that's one of the reasons that'll get people to, to stay on nicotine. Um, but then there's other metabolic activity and other things which happen, which makes it harder, harder for you to quit. That is your withdrawal symptoms are more severe. And so there are individual differences is what I mean to say here. But uh, it's, it's a serious thing to become addicted to nicotine. And for many people, it's, it's, it's really challenging to stop using it. And so here's, here's the current use from 2017 to 2021. This is a, a monitoring the future study. If you're not familiar with this, they, they take a nationally representative sample um, every year um, and they can divide it into different categories. So the purple is eighth grade and the orange is, is um, 10th grade and uh, the maroon uh, uh, is for 12th grade. And so ju just to give you a snapshot on, on what's happening in 2021, we can see 12%, 19, I have to move my, picture in 26 percent of kids still a lot of kids so it, it, it's a reduction from 35 percent in 2020 uh, went down in 2021 and in other surveys it's showing a resurgence back uh, in 2022 and, and I think part of the reason is that uh, during COVID when kids were staying home from school um, Smoking is a social behavior, and if you're not social with your friends at school, if you're if you're not at school, if you're staying at home a lot, if you're uh, you know tele educating yourself, then there's fewer opportunities to start using. Um, every kid that starts using an e-cigarette is at risk for becoming dependent um, and then addicted. Uh, and if they become addicted, they're then at risk for using other combustible products. Uh, and and that's, that's the pattern that we see with adults in a number of instances is that, you know, people that smoke cigarettes and then start using e-cigarettes to, to help them quit end up smoking both. And that means they're smoking all day long in areas where they couldn't smoke before because e-cigarettes, um, although they might, although now there's, there's indoor air quality standards for e-cigarettes too, but they're so easy to sneak. Um, and so when you go into the, go into the, the bathroom, um, you can smoke an e-cigarette and not many people will know. There's still a smell, but it's not that tobacco smell and it doesn't hang on your clothes the same way. Oops. And so here's a different survey from the CDC. They also take data just on tobacco. So the Monitor in the Future uh, covers all different forms of substance use. It's up at University of Michigan. If you're not familiar with it and you work or thinking about working in substance use, I would, I would I would definitely go and look at their reports. They're they're very detailed. Here we're seeing um, National Youth Tobacco Survey, and that's taken every year. Um, the 2022 data has been released. Just a, a small a snippet of it. All, all all they have released is the middle school numbers and the high school numbers. So that's the average ninth through twelfth grade. So it looks a little bit different than what we saw before because I was just showing you twelfth uh, grade numbers. Um, and here we can see a, an increase in, in 2019 is the year when e-cigarettes peaked in the United States. Um, this was followed then by uh, COVID. And here we see it going down in 21 and then back up in 2022. Now the kids are back in school. Although there's a number of other actions that have taken place. Uh, one and a major one is that uh, between 19 and 20 is when the uh, national uh, age 21 came into play. So Texas had uh, initiated an age of 21 law in the last legislation session um, after in, in 2000, well, yeah, in 2021. But shortly thereafter, actually, I made a mistake. Th shortly thereafter, the, the U.S. government went ahead and make it a, a federal law. So that happened. Um, some flavors were taken off in the marketplace. That happened uh, after 2019. Um, they also banned flavors, certain or most of the flavors in jewel cartridges. So the so under the Trump administration, they they uh, enacted with the FDA uh, a ban of uh, flavors except for mint and tobacco for cartridge devices. And what that happened is the jewel use rate went way way down, and the disposable e-cigarette use went way way up because they were exempt from the flavoring issue. So we're still in discussions with FDA and flavoring, and that, that's a big reason why kids are attracted to trying e-cigarettes in the first place, because there's so many, I mean, literally thousands of different flavors. And if you're naive and you don't know there's nicotine in them, you might go ahead and take a puff. 
And, you know, for some people, if you're predisposed genetically, it might not take that many puffs before you start developing dependence and then addiction. And so here's an example of the addiction. This slide shows um, how many days per month they used e-cigarettes amongst users. And so again, over the years, so early on, um, one to two days a month, not, not very much. And then that slid down up until 2021. Over here on the other side, um, this is using every day. And so you can see it's increasing. This is an indicator of, I mean, daily use is an indicator of addiction with kids. Um, and so uh, 20 to 29 is what's considered frequent use. And that also has increased quite a bit. It went down a little bit in these two years in part because it went up for the daily use. But anyway, so we're, we're, we're now faced with uh, X percent of the United States kids uh, somewhere between 10 to 20 ish. And by the way, it varies quite a bit by, uh, by a state in the country and in city too, uh, how much there is. So Texas is about in the middle. So 20, 15, 20 ish percent of kids are, are, are using, and a lot of them are starting to use every day and they're becoming addicted. Uh, addiction has other uh, unintended consequences too. And I've heard this, I guess Priscilla can probably tell us more. And, and that is, you know, kids who are addicted, sometimes they can't make it through the whole morning of classes without puffing. And so they're smoking in, in class in order to relieve their withdrawal symptoms. So it's not just this nasty little habit that kids get, or they, you know, they're trying to be funny to get away with smoking in class. They're actually addicted. And, and so they, they have to smoke. And so th this is a, a key point because you can, at a school level, either choose to discipline the kids or help them find treatment so that they can uh, get out of their addiction. Here's another example. Um, one of the key dependence measures in, in the uh, uh, tobacco literature is, is how soon you start smoking after you wake up. And we can see here, 2014, 15, up until 17, oops, up until 17, um, at or about the time where Juul entered the marketplace, it just started skyrocketing. And what that tells you is that the current types of uh, vaping devices now have a much more, deliver a much more concentrated level of nicotine. So back here, you might be getting 20 milligram, milliliters per milligram of nicotine in the concentration. Up here, nowadays, it's at least 50 milligrams per milliliter and sometimes it's over 100. So the, the products today are much more addictive is what this slide is illustrating, but, but we know this from sales data too. Oops. Um, <laughs> there's a lot going on here and I'm gonna send you guys these slides if you wanna digest this a little more fully, but the, the basic things are, are underlined in the text below. And so Cochrane, which is a major um, uh, organization that does uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis says there's moderate certainty that e-cigarettes are successful as a cessation device. The United States Preventive Services Task Force, which, which governs reimbursement systems for a lot of different things, says the evidence is insufficient. And so we're, we're sort of in the middle of a number of different studies which are trying to find out whether e-cigarettes, uh, actually this is all with adults, not with kids. We, we don't quite know what to do with kids that, uh, for something that is uh, successful in helping them quit. So it's individualized treatment, um, but uh, so for, for your average smoker, uh, above, you know, it's out of high school and they want to use e-cigarettes, you're, you're almost as likely to quit using cigarettes as you are to continue using both of them. And, and therein lies the problem. So we know what works. We've got 50, 60 years of policies that have reduced the, the tobacco rate. Remember the first slide I showed you? Uh, had to do with the monitoring the future and seeing that reduction over time. So here, here's the different things that, that can happen that should happen in local communities, should be local smoke-free policies, and they should include e-cigarettes. There should be school and family level education. There should be hard-hitting media campaigns. Uh, usually those are funded by national organizations like the Truth Initiative or the CDC or, or other groups. Um, sometimes Texas has in the past allocated tobacco prevention dollars through the settlement funds. There should be access to cessation. There should be tobacco price increases. I mean, this is especially important for kids. 
um, because they're price sensitive. Um, and last legislative session, we did for the, for the first time add a tax onto e-cigarettes, but you know, I testified to a couple different groups uh, and at the legislature that it was too small of a tax increase. So while there's a little money being put back into the system, it's not high enough. We, we, we know enough to know how big the tax should be to be meaningful. Um, and then there's availability issues, um, whether they're accessible online, um, whether you can actually uh, determine a person's age when they're buying things online or in convenience stores too. There's pricing and promotion. You can restrict the promotion. You can increase the price through federal um, and, and state level mechanisms too. Um, you can um, influence the way that things are advertised at the point of purchase or displays. Um, there's age of sale, but that, that's been accomplished. Then there's retail licensure for e-cigarettes. And I'm not sure if Texas actually licenses e-cigarettes, um, although maybe that was in with the, the age 21. Uh, I have to double check on that. But retail licensure is important so that you know where the e-cigarettes are being sold. And, and then you can do the random spot checks to see whether the servers are actually following the compliance with the age 21. And so I've spent a lot of time in the last five or six years, and, and, and here's my interpretation of the policy toolbox. These are different things that one could consider that are evidence-based. A lot of them are in the, the uh, Preventive Services Task Force um, or in Cochrane or meta-analyses. So uh, it's uh, marketing. You can work. You can see here, there's a number of things that can be done. Uh, age of sale laws, uh, indoor, outdoor, clean air, uh, prevention, cessation, taxation. Uh, is part of consumption, uh, manufacturing. And, and this is what you might be hearing is uh, e-cigarettes are undergoing what's called a pre-market uh, assessment by the FDA. And so not very many have been approved yet by the FDA, but they're not, uh, it, it took a long time for e-cigarettes to be considered tobacco product so that then it would be under the enforcement of the federal government at and through the FDA. Uh, and so these companies are now being forced, well, they are being forced. It, it, it took too long, but now, now they're in the process of actually preparing a package for the FDA so people can review uh, on the other end at, at the FDA as to whether or not there's a, a, a risk of uh, teens using the product or that it could cause a, a problem. I think we do have a problem. So it's hard for the industry to say that they're, they're not involved in a youth problem. Uh, and second of all, it should be safer. There should be harm reduction and it shouldn't um, uh, be marketed to kids or kids should not be um, using it in, in excessive numbers. And, and so those are the two main criteria. There's a whole bunch of criteria. These packages are really big and thick. And maybe you read this summer that Juul did not pass their pre-market um, and then were, were banned by FDA. And then a judge overturned that ban and they're, they're now resubmitting their package. To Congress. So a number of different, I'm sorry, to FDA. So a number of, there, there's thousands of companies, um, not just with the devices, but also with the e-liquid itself, which is the thing that uh, nicotine is put into and then becomes vaporized and you breathe it into your lungs. So just a few warning signs that have been seen, um, irritability, anxiety, mood changes, lack of impulse control. These are all have to do with the effects of nicotine on kids. And what I like to say to middle school teachers is, would you like more irritable kids? You want kids that are prone to mood changes? Kids already have a tough enough time in middle school and high school with impulse control. And then there's cognitive impairments, which lead to uh, reductions in grades. So the, the first two, difficulty concentrating and behavioral changes uh, are our problem. You know, the anxiety, uh, with a number of kids comes from their anxiety of looming withdrawal symptoms. Once you get civic, if you get addicted, you're, you, you, you're constantly thinking about when can you get the next cigarette when you're in a situation where you can't smoke. That's why you see people at hospitals standing outside the building smoking. Um, anyway, there's a number of other things too. Um, I'll leave you to, to read that because we need to move on. And so this is my collection of, of actions that schools have been taking to, to work on e-cigarettes and it falls into the discipline or the treatment categories. And so um, at the top part, we say, well, a number of schools just don't do anything. Others 
uh, confiscate the device. There's detention, suspension, restriction of ex I'm sorry, ex oops, come back. Restriction of extracurricular activities. Some have been sent to uh, alternative schools. Uh, some have been asked to do community service in lieu of suspension, uh, detention, alternative school expulsion. And then the school police are, are, are getting involved too. So this, this is what you know, many of us call a big old nuisance <laughs> for schools. And I, I've talked to some school administrators and, and they, they now have so many kids that they catch with e-cigarettes that they're having to hire additional staff just to process the kids. Because you know, in, in many cases, the procedure is to, you know, if you catch them, then you call the parents. That might lead to a, a parent-student-teacher conference um, if you start sending kids to alternative school, parents get upset and then they're calling and needing to find out. And it's, it's just easy to see that um, it's costing schools more money just because they're catching the kids. Uh, there's, there's a whole nother issue with what to do once you confiscate the device and how to safely dispose of it. There's EPA regulations about how to dispose of e-cigarettes. It's part of the lithium batteries. On the treatment side, there are often drug counselors uh, at the school who can assist, uh, parent-teacher conferences, referral to a doctor, rehab. Um, the other thing is if the police get involved, sometimes the devices may have had uh, marijuana in them or THC oil, and, and now we're talking about a felony offense. Uh, and although school districts and, and police will, will do different things when they catch people with regard to the felony part, but but in, in some ways you are criminalizing kids if up here uh, and uh, with treatment, there are just not a lot of options available. So I, I still think that prevention is, is the best way to go. Um, I've met a number of parents where kids have been through um, you know, week long in-house drug counseling and uh, they've repeated it five or six times because the addiction is very strong. Once you get that addicted, um, you're also in the area because they're illegal. You're starting to do illegal things. You're more likely then to start using alcohol and, and other drugs, although that relationship is not quite as strong. Something related to that is if you have a vaping device in your pocket at all times because you're addicted to nicotine, that vaping device, some of them can be used for THC. And if you haven't checked in with THC in the last uh, decade or so, the amount of it in terms of concentration has gone up dramatically. And so when I was in high school, um, the average marijuana would have 2% THC. Uh, in 2017, it ranged from 17 to 28%. So that's a, a multiple fold increase in, in THC use. So I'm gonna turn it over to Priscilla now, and she's gonna talk to you about a program that uh, we've worked on together called the Catch My Breath that's also distributed now by uh, the Catch Global Foundation. So do you want to, do you want to take over the screen, Priscilla? Um, or do you want me to move the slides? If you want to keep moving the slides, that's fine. That works. Okay, let's do awesome. that. Awesome, so thank you, Dr. Kelter. Great review um, of the problem. And so in, in response to that problem, um, Catch My Breath is a program that is available for free to all schools in the U.S., um, and it's completely online, digital. Um, another thing we like to point out to folks, um, back in January of 2020, Catch My Breath demonstrated effectiveness in a peer-reviewed study, uh, making it the first and currently only evidence-based youth vaping prevention program. Um, that study was published in public health reports, and so that's just something else that we like to um, let people know about our program. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, it's uh, just showing you that our program is available for elementary, middle, and high schools. Um, schools can choose to implement the program in any grade or all grades because um, each track is standalone. Uh, the program consists of four lessons that take about 35 minutes. Um, we recommend that schools deliver the lessons uh, once per week over the course of four weeks. Um, just so that you all know, the lessons have a combination of teacher presentations uh, with and peer facilitated small groups and discussions. Um, something else I wanna note here um, is that Catch My Breath is the only program that we know of that has been adjusted to account for developmental appropriateness. Um, and it's also been evaluated for behavioral effects, not just you know, changes in knowledge and things like that, but we're actually, uh, we've seen other uh, behavioral outcomes. 
Um, we also offer detailed teaching instructions that include um, educator guides, which I'll show you in a minute, um, with scripts also embedded into the slides, um, whether you use Google Slides or PowerPoint slides. Um, and uh, we've gotten great feedback from teachers saying that they feel confident using the lessons. Um, they don't feel like they need to be the expert in tobacco prevention um, because of all of the materials um, and all of the support that's provided for them for, for each of the sessions. And so another question we get is where can Catch My Breath be taught? Well, it can be taught in a variety of subjects. As you can see, um, we also uh, included a PE supplemental um, material that can be used in uh, PE class. And so that's a great resource as well that, um, that PE teachers can use that really go along and um, reinforce what they're learning in, in the classroom. Um, and something else that we know is important, um, before I worked for Catch Global um, as a trainer, um, I, was a, I was a sixth grade ELA teacher for a few years before um, going to the district level to bring uh, coordinate school health to our district. And in that process, I've realized how important it is for, for these programs that we're introducing to our schools to really align to our standards that our teachers need to um, uphold to and align with. So Catch My Breath um, uh, does align to multiple national health education standards as well as um, many state standards. I know for the, since we're in Texas, um, we also align to the health teaks. Um, as well. And so teachers can meet those uh, requirements um, as they implement Catch My Breath. Um, and so we also incorporate other things like uh, social emotional learning um, and CASEL, which is the gold standard for social emotional learning. Um, so we're really excited to be able to offer that holistic uh, learning experience for students. Um, in addition, um, we also like to mention the peer-led discussion groups as being um, a, a central pillar of Catch My Breath. We use that in every lesson really to help students address and discuss those social norms, behavioral tensions, all in their own words. Um, we offer an opportunity for youth to lead that conversation in their classroom around vaping. Um, there's peer-to-peer -peer, uh, facilitation guides for these sessions as well. Um, teachers can choose whether they want to uh, do more of the facilitation themselves or hand it off to their students and train them to be those facilitators. Um, and so we are flexible in that, you know, the teacher knows their classroom the best and so they can offer however they see fit. But we're really glad to empower youth to have a lead in that conversation around vaping. Um, lastly, uh, before I dive into more of the actual platform, um, we use uh, other educational strategies as well, such as uh, Bloom's Taxonomy or Rigor um, that's sprinkled throughout all of our lessons, can be seen in our educator guides. Um, we offer guided notes, so we offer worksheets that go along with each session that have fill in the blanks um, so that students can follow along. Um, in addition to that, we have check for understanding, which is used in our exit tickets. We have knowledge checks at the beginning and end of our lessons to make sure students are grasping the concepts. Um, we use criteria for success as well, um, and then scaffolding, which is especially um, seen in our advertising and appeals activity. Um, and so this is where you can find all of our, um, our programs. Our curriculum is on our catch.org platform. You will need to just uh, sign up, create your account for free, um, and then enroll in the Catch My Breath uh, program. And so this is what it looks like. This is where all of our programs are housed. Um, when you click on the purple tile for uh, Catch My Breath, that'll take you into our, uh, our suite of, um, of resources. Um, and so in the, let's see, the next slide, I believe, um, one of the things that we have are educator guides, and that is fantastically um, helpful for our teachers um, as it provides all of the information that they'll need by session, including materials and prep, uh, key terms, overview, how it aligns to their standards, um, and it's a breakdown for each session. Um, and so we have that available for every uh, one of our lessons and even in our supplemental materials that I'll touch on in a second. Um, so in addition to our educator guide, we also provide, um, in the next slide, you'll see our presentation slides. That's just a little snippet of what it looks like online. Um, you can download in Google Slides or download as a PowerPoint. Um, and either way, you'll get those scripts for every single um, portion of that, which has a good breakdown of an agenda for um, time's sake. And then it has um, everything that you'll need throughout that lesson. Um, it'll show that in the slides as well. 
Um, the next thing uh, we just want to highlight our student worksheets that are also included in every uh, session. Um, and so those are downloadable. Um, they can be printed um, or just provided digitally to students so that they can follow along through the through the lessons. Um, and then just lastly, I want to touch on um, we also have pre and post surveys that you can just print off and disseminate to students as as you wish. Um, and so you can kind of track to see how they're uh, how they're doing and their uh, changes in, in knowledge and other outcomes as well. Um, so that's all for students, uh, educators. We're also excited to have parent resources. Um, and so we have not only do we have like an introductory letter and informational um, uh, flyers and forms. We also are excited um, to share our parent toolkit, um, which is on um, the next slide. Um, and all that is housed in our uh, in our uh, platform. And so as you can see, we have um, anywhere from the information that goes out to uh, the toolkit, which I'll show you more on in a second. Um, and then we have a presentation that can also be shared with parents and short little videos that go along with the toolkit. So uh, in the next slide, this is just a little bit of a of a um, of a, uh, a sneak peek into what our toolkit has, um, and then the videos that go along with it. We have activities for parents. Um, we don't just want them to know the facts. We want them to also realize that their child is at risk. We want them to feel um, confident in having that conversation with their children, um, and then we include spaces for them to work through that um, and to. Um, to practice having that conversation and then um, obviously arming them with all the facts that they need to. Um, and so the only part that we charge for in addition to our training, which if you want more information on training, email me, we'll make sure that I share my email with you. We offer video lessons. Um, this is based on demand. Uh, schools were asking for recorded lessons, especially during distance learning and other situations. We offer this at a price as well. And so if you want more information on our video lessons, feel free to also uh, send me an email. Um, the last bit of information I know I'm going to try to wrap up in the next couple minutes are our supplemental materials. These are newer. We've uh, added these in, as a result of our partnership with Discovery Ed, uh, DentaQuest. Uh, we offer uh, supplemental lessons, as you can see here. Just to give you a little bit of an idea, in the next slide, um, you'll see that we offer... Um, the vaping, lung health, and infectious disease component. That's a one-off lesson um, that teachers can go through with their students and makes that connection between vaping and other diseases. Um, that also has the educator guide in the, in the notes by slide. Um, and then we have our physical education component, which I mentioned are PE supplements. Um, and that has activities broken out uh, by session, as I mentioned. And so that's something else that we like to encourage our, uh, especially our physical educators to use. And then uh, we have a, um, as a result of a partnership, we have our be vape free component, which are um, anywhere from videos to self paced modules that are really great for assigning students to do or if they're in alternative settings. Um, that's also a nice, a nice thing to be able to give students. Um, nope. In addition to STEM and humanities, we also have oral health. Um, and so that's also a one off lesson that you can use um, in any type of uh, setting um, as well. Um, and so I think that wraps up my part. Uh, that's just more information on how to access the videos. But again, if you have questions and if you'd like to make purchases, um, I'll share my email address with you all. Yeah, yeah just a couple more. I, sorry, Priscilla, I changed it a little bit. Yep. Here's just a listing of all the different features that we've made with Catch My Breath. Uh, and uh, I, I will say, you know, this has been a great collaboration with a whole bunch of different partners. And uh, so I, I was fortunate enough to have been selected on the Surgeon General Report, which came out in 2016 on vaping, uh, as the epidemiologist looking at the harmful effects of e-cigarettes. And so I dug way deep into that. And, and while I was doing that, I thought, well, this is going to be a real problem for schools. I, I saw that because of the flavors that it was going to be attractive to kids. And so I, I wrote the first version to Catch My Breath. Um, and then worked with Catch Global Foundation to make it better. Did a lot of pilot testing back and forth. That's where the study that Priscilla mentioned came from uh, here in, in uh, Travis County. Um, and then we were, were fortunate enough that CVS, which made a commitment to remove combustible tobacco products from their pharmacies, uh, found us and, and asked us whether we would like support to, to reach out for e-cigarettes because they, 
they hadn't thought about that e-cigarettes when they when they removed combustible tobacco. So we had uh, some additional funding to um, increase the production value uh, of the the program and to to create all these extra pieces. Uh, and then Discovery gave us a little bit more money to work with Discovery Education. And then it's been a great partnership with them because. We, we are now on their discovery education uh, platform. So you can find all these things either on the Catch Global Foundation platform or on discovery education. And they have such a, a, a large reach into schools with discovery. Um, and so, you know, clear, <laughs> clearing the air um, was a, a, a big component. Um, the DentaQuest at the bottom came because we've been working with another project called Catch, Ma Catch Healthy Smiles, which is a kindergarten oral health program. Because we're working with dentists, they said, well, what about e-cigarettes and oral health? So we dug into that and said, well, yeah, there's a, there's a little problem with that too. So we, we now have a few activities related to that. Uh, and then vaping uh, and infectious disease. When COVID hit, it's like, well, what, how is this related? Well, teens aren't the best to at wiping off with a sanitary <laughs> uh, pad or anything uh, for cleaning their vaping devices. So if you're in a social setting, you're just handing it around, try this flavor, you might be transmitting um, the virus. And, uh, and then on top of that, there's uh, issues with uh, vaping and COVID. It, it's known to be related to the incidence of COVID. Uh, and then there was eValley. So what, what was eValley and how is that related to vaping? It turns out that was vaping of uh, of uh, poor quality uh, THC oil. Let's see. Oh, yeah. And so here's here's an example of uh, Priscilla and I presented this at Ysleta, a school district that's using it. And so just an example of what schools can do. So here's what we recommended in the fall, and then here's what we recommended in the spring. Uh, and then this is for eighth grade. And so did I get these right? Sorry, I had it backwards. That's eighth grade. This is seventh grade. Uh, so this is just an example of how schools could be in process teaching kids about vaping um, throughout different years uh, in, in middle school uh, when most kids are starting to use e-cigarettes. Whoops. And there, now we're done. <laughs> so yeah, good. So we have some time to, to uh, uh, answer questions. Let me stop sharing. And um, a lot of familiar faces, it's so nice. So any questions? Uh, Dr. Kelder, I see a question in the chat. Um, so oh, okay. yeah, uh, Michelle Smith said um, that there, there seems to be um, a faction that really supports vaping as an alternative to tobacco. And you kind of touched on this a little bit on one of your slides, I believe. Um, and so is there really um, any research that, that shows the effectiveness of this? Yeah, no, there's a lot of research and, and, and that's why you know, Cochrane is calling it uh, as of last year, uh, mod mildly or moderately effective. And so there's some studies that say it works and a bunch of studies that say it doesn't work. And so we're stuck. And, and then you have to look at the quality of the studies. Uh, the, the reason for the conflict has to do with uh, vaping being a harm reduction strategy. And so if people can, so you can get your nicotine without getting all the harmful constituents which are in combustible. You know, when you burn something, you, you make a whole bunch of new chemicals and, and, and a lot of them are really bad for you, as we know. And, and that's the problem with smoking. Uh, but, well, fires too, I suppose, that's another issue. But uh, so there is a, a conflict between people who are involved in adult cessation and people like me that's involved with prevention with kids. And so we sort of bang our heads a little bit. And so when, when I say, let's reduce the number of flavors, um, the harm reduction folks say, well, that's why adults will use it because it tastes better than a cigarette. And so we, we have to reconcile that. I don't know if we've done a great job so far. Um, but uh, clearly kids shouldn't start using. And clearly if you want to quit, there's, there's a number of different options. And so I don't know of any health organizations uh, other than in Great Britain with their public health service. Uh, in the US, there's, uh, I've looked in, in 25 different health organizations that do not recommend e-cigarettes yet because they're not falling into those, you, you, um, 
uh, Preventive Services Task Force guidelines as to an effective program. So time will tell on this, on this question. However, my sister smokes. I'm, I'm the youngest in my family, so I bought her a jewel. I believe it is a harm reduction strategy. Uh, what I looked at in terms of just, just comparing the harmful effects of e-cigarettes versus tobacco, well, tobacco wins hands down. Wins in the sense that it's worse, much, much, worse. much worse. And so, you know, the 2018 National Academy of Sciences report summed it up nicely and said, well, e-cigarettes are less harmful than combustible, but they're not harmless. Hmm. And, right, and then, right. you know, you saw the slide where we, we're now down to 3% of kids are using combustible tobacco. And at one point, we're up to 40% of kids for using, using e-cigarettes. So that just, that can't stand in my world. <laughs> agreed, agreed. And, and thinking about ultimately the prevention strategies, because ultimately, we don't want children to begin the use of either nicotine um, through whether it's traditional cigarettes or, or um, e-cigarettes. Other questions? Yeah. Other questions from some of our attendees? I'm pretty sure Karen Brunell has a question. There must yeah. be something wrong with their microphone. <laughs> I think you've answered all of them, Dr. Keldon. Is that good? <laughs> good to I see didn't you. know who else to put on the spot. Maybe, <laughs> maybe Pat Mauser. I haven't seen talk to you in a long time. Yeah, Trisha. <laughs> uh, Trisha, said, that's true. I, I am still here and I am listening, though. Th this is all new to me. And Steve, you can relate to this. I actually graduated high school in 72. So uh -huh. th think of me as your older sister. <laughs> but, but I do remember the combustible cigarettes um, being the cool thing, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And I'm thrilled to see that the actual use of that has gone down so dramatically. But we never dreamt in our wildest imagination about an e-cigarette or, well, or any number of things in technology today. And so what concerns me is now as a grandparent, having grandchildren in uh, elementary, middle and high school, that these are the types of uh, situations that they are being exposed to that I had never considered. And the repercussions long term are scary. Mm -hmm. it, it can be a little scary. I, I know friends of mine whose kids started using it and, and, and they're addicted. And they're, they're, it's just, it, it becomes a, a continuing conflict at school and at home. Sure. Uh, and uh, so that, that conflict's not healthy either. No, and as Tricia said, you know, so what's the cool thing now? Uh, I also have a, uh, have a middle schooler and a, a freshman in college. And so, yeah, uh, what, they're, what, what is now being seen as the cool thing to do? Um, you know, how, how do we um, support our, our, our youth moving away from, um, from that stigma of cool, cool e-cigarettes? Absolutely. Other any any others? That's Michelle again. Are there is anybody going for new legislation at the state level this session around vaping or? Uh, I do not know that yet. No, no one's asked me to look at anything, and I guess I'm not plugged in the same way as some of you are. I don't think Joel's still on. I, no, he had to jump off. No, we're doing. You know, I think. There, there's a lot in the works with federal action. You know, if they remove nicotine, that, that's going to be a major step forward. Uh, and the FDA is already in their pre-market review phase so that some of these could be, it, it could be handled in part by the federal legislation. But uh, there's so many moving parts that there, people might be waiting on the legislation to see what the feds are doing. I think that's possible. There is another question. Uh, what about the popcorn lung that the vapes cause? and the drugs that people mix these vapes. Yeah, popcorn lung comes from uh, uh, a chemical that they put in early on called diacetyl. 
And, uh, you know, that one was a little bit speculative to begin with because the popcorn lung comes from people who work in factories where they produce the diacetyl <laughs> um, and they're breathing it all day long. And so there, there's a number of issues to sort out with, well, how much diacetyl before it's bad for you? You know, the EPA has limits on, on all kinds of different uh, toxins and, and, and other things. And so many will say that the diacetyl fell well below the, the threshold, but I think the industry has taken it off on their own because they don't have to have that flavor when there's 1500 other flavors, you know. Any other thoughts? We've oh. been working uh, on tobacco prevention efforts in El Paso and that is, coinciding with the uh, THC issues, as particularly there because of their close proximity to New Mexico. And, you know, the number of students who have been arrested for felonies because they were caught with th vaping THC has gone from like two per year to uh, a huge number. Yeah. Uh, and what are y'all seeing uh, as far as how do we, you know, add that into the mix? I know it's, it's a drug versus nicotine, but uh, they're, they're both vaping. And it's, it's like, you know, you start with nicotine and then you go and you get THC and it's not that big a deal. And the next thing you know, you're a convicted felon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really unfortunate. You know, vaping has transformed the, the marijuana industry, vaping and gummies by the way. And so there's just a new report that came out with, uh, you know, preschool kids who are eating gummies and trips to the emergency room. So that, that's becoming a, that's becoming a real issue too. Mm. But uh, so yeah, this technology exists. And so people are using it and kids are getting caught and uh, you know, it's not decriminalized in this state, uh, although it might be someday, but still, I don't think we'll ever decriminalize kids using these substances. So we're, we're going to have this issue and it will continue. Um, we have written a couple of uh, vaping less, I'm sorry, uh, marijuana lessons, but I, I haven't pilot tested them yet. And so it seems like a natural addition. I mean, we, we, we added the oral health because uh, DentaQuest uh, gave us a little cash to, to figure out how to make it just right. And, it, you know, that was two lessons. And we took like three months to make sure we weren't doing things wrong because I didn't know dentistry all that well. So we had dentists on the call and so on. Um, there is a call for, for this, Michelle. And uh, uh, I don't know when exactly we'll have a, a good solution, but I'm, I'm working on it. Um, there are some opportunities for grants through the NIH too. So I'm working with a group that's gonna probably apply, but you know how long it takes to, to, to get an NIH grant from beginning to end. We'll, okay. we'll still have five more years of, of kids that are being exposed to it. There's not a great answer is, is what I'm saying. <laughs> I hate criminalizing kids though for that purpose. Yeah, that's the concern. It's, I'm not I'm saying they shouldn't have consequences or it should be decriminalized, but, uh, you know, there's got to be options. Right. For a six versus a 16 year old having a felony on their record. Absolutely. Ah, uh, thank you. Okay. Any other You're questions? Welcome. I was just going to chime in and say that, um, you know, just to reiterate a lot of the stuff in the school districts, you know, Shaq's trying to explore ways to combat this, obviously, in the school districts. And so very timely uh, going into our next session with the Shaq discussion to see, you know, our districts utilizing the Catch My Breath curriculum because it is free um, and, and it is, you know, so, you know, research based. So um, interested to see what some of our panelists um, are doing and if others are using it and bringing it towards their shacks. Yeah, I will say um, I do present to shacks. I've, I've done it several times where I have like two to five minute windows and I've been able to give my, my spiel and, and we've had some shacks here recently that have approved Catch My Breath and presented it to their boards and gotten approval. Um, you know, they're moving forward with making those recommendations. So I know of some that are um, taking it on as far as their shack are taking it on upon themselves to, to really try to move the needle and in introducing, you know, catch my breath as a preventative tool. So I'm excited to, to see other shacks, um, you know, kind of jump on board um, and, and, you know, ask for 
ask for these resources because they're they're out there and we are proud of our, our parent toolkit, our parent materials that not everyone has extensive or comprehensive parent materials. Um, a lot of times it's informational, um, but I really like that we've, you know, Dr. Keller's taking that care and extra step in providing uh, those uh, other types of comprehensive uh, components to the parent materials that we do offer. So yeah, feel free to explore that as well. It's, it's, all, it's all out there, it's all digital. So, um, you know, share what you want with, with your shacks and, and, you know, if they need other information, I'll leave my chat um, information in the chat as well. I might also add that Catch My Breath is recognized by CDC as a program, uh, as well as SAMHSA. And so those of, you, those of you who are in the substance use field know that uh, a SAMHSA approval is, is kind of a big deal because it, it opens the doors for drug-free schools funding for, for this. Um, anyway, it's, it's been really interesting preparing this and watching the, the, the growth and know, the decline of these cigarettes and where it'll end up. I don't know exactly in a few years with kids, but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll take care of that and we'll figure out whether it's effective with adults as a cessation tool. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelder, uh, Priscilla. Thank y'all for joining us today. This was good information. Uh, we really appreciated learning about um, the Catch Your Breath resources and uh, the availability of it to so many schools. Um, we, we are thankful for taking the time today. And uh, I know that, uh, Dr. Kelder, if you will um, share the presentation with us, uh, with Michelle and myself, I know that when we send out um, the follow-up uh, to our attendees, um, I'm sure others will be interested in, in reviewing the presentation again. And, uh, and so thank you. Sure, very happy. Um, I, I sent it already to Michelle. I don't have your email address. Oh, so. I've got, I'll get it through Michelle, it's fine. Okay, and, and, and if any of you want to use these slides, I, I feel no ownership over them. Just take them, use them any way you want. Thank you, thank, everyone. Thank you, okay. everyone. Take care. Uh, bye -bye. We have bye bye. We have a few minutes uh, in between our next uh, presentation. Um, uh, we are. I think I saw uh, Ilyana on already. Oh, there she is. Hi, um, Ilyana. Would you like to go ahead and and um, do our conduct our little break or first and then give everybody a few minutes to go fill up their uh, water and cup or would you like um, us to wait until 1105? No, that works. I can just we'll do the brain break and then everybody can have a little you know potty time and then yeah. uh, right before our next presentation and but okay. it's also a break, so. <laughs> okay, Ileana, then, then we're gonna turn it over to Ileana from um, the Catch Global Foundation, another one of our partners. Yeah, hi, um, my name is Ileana Ramirez. Uh, I work as a training and implementation specialist with uh, Catch Global. Uh, so Priscilla is one of my colleagues and uh, I obviously I believe in health. Uh, so here at Catch, we love to connect everything that we do um, for our whole child, and that it also includes our physical and our mental health. Um, so with that being said, I know we've been kind of groggy, right? We've been sitting at the computer staring for a while. Um, so when I say go, I would like for everyone to kind of stand in front of their computer, find some space, um, turn on cameras if it's possible, just to really participate. Because our motto here in Catch is if it ain't fun, it don't get done. Um, so I would love to participate with you all. So if you all could turn on your cameras, get in front, ready and go. So go ahead and stand in front of your, if you want to turn on your cameras, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you. <laughs> it's hard to do it on my own. It's more fun if you participate with me. Thank you. Thank you, Kara. As we're waiting for um, some of our friends to just kind of get in front of their camera and do a little stretch as we're going. Awesome. Okay. So 
What we're going to do today is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to share my screen and we are going, I'm going to lead you through a warm up that we have here at Catch. It's part of our PE curriculum, um, but it's also used throughout our curriculum as brain break. So here we go. I'm going to share. Here we go. All right. So can, give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So this is our brain break for today. We are going to be playing a game called Quick Draw. So three easy steps. You're gonna start with a hand behind your back. Um, when you hear the word Quick Draw, you're going to either, you're gonna show either one finger or two fingers. That's pretty simple, right? Um, so if we are the same, you're going to do a certain activity, but if we're different, so you're playing against me, you're going to do the different activity. Okay, pretty simple, hand behind back, uh, listening for quick draw, you're showing, okay? Uh, then you'll decide if we're the same or different and we'll do the activity. Are y'all ready? Okay, so first activity, we are focusing on level one. I love to use level inclusion, we always building up. Um, anything we do today has modifications. Uh, level one, obviously a little bit lower end, so not too much modification, but our windmills that you see, if we're the same, so either it's a one one or a two two, uh, it's a windmill. You don't have to go down as far. You can touch your knee or just come, you know, touch your thigh um, and then different. You obviously don't have to go as far twisting left and right. Are y'all ready? So hand behind your back and quick draw. Okay, so the same, you gotta do windmills and a difference, you're twisting, rotating. There you go, get some go get some juices flowing, waking up this morning. Awesome, we'll do that for five more seconds. Three, two, and one. We're gonna do a couple of rounds. So we're always changing either the same or different. So hand behind back, ready, and quick draw. Okay, all right, so 10 more seconds. Choose your, if we were the same or different. Awesome. Five more seconds, four, three, two, and one. All right, we're gonna do one more round and then we're gonna switch to our level two. Ready? Hand behind back and quick draw. Oh, we all are the same that we're on. Okay, so last round, last 10 seconds, building up. Maybe this time you're going a little bit further. Your body's more awake. You're, you're alert today. Awesome. Okay, three, two, and one. Go ahead and relax. All right, so now we're building up. So this was working on flexibility. Um, next, we're going to be working on muscular strength. Okay, so we're, so we're slowly building there. So we get the same, you're gonna be doing squats. Again, you don't have to go down that low and different. You're gonna be doing arm circles. Are y'all ready? Okay, hand behind that and quick draw. Okay, all right, 10 seconds. Whichever activity that you got the same or different. Awesome. Five more seconds. Three, two, and one, relax. All right, we're gonna do two more rounds of muscular strength and quick draw. Okay, go ahead and choose if we were the same, or I guess you don't choose, but you do the same or different. Okay, awesome. Five more seconds. Three, two, and one. All right, last one in muscular strength. And quick draw. Okay. Ooh, we're all the same that round. All right. And go ahead. 10 seconds or 10 squats. Three seconds, two, and one. Awesome. Go ahead and relax. We have one last level and we are going to be doing focusing on cardiovascular efficiency. Uh, so obviously this game is interchangeable. It could be as easy or as hard as you want it. Um, for cardiovascular efficiency, you can make accommodations. You don't have to add a jump for your jump rope. If you want to just have your hands lift, quite all right. Same with jogging in place for different. If you want to just march in place or pump your arms, fine with me. Are you all ready? And quick draw. 
Okay, and we have our activity for seven more seconds. Six, five, four, three, two, and one. Relax. And two more rounds of this. And quick draw. Okay. Awesome job. Getting our bodies nice and warm. You know, when you lift up your arms above your head, it causes um, brain flow to your brain so that you're more creative. And go ahead and one last round. And quick draw. Woo, all the same again. <laughs> all right, last 10 seconds of work here. And six, five, four, three, two, and one. Okay, nice work, everyone. Thank you so much for participating with me. Um, so again, here in here at Catch, we believe that there's that not it's a whole child. Not only are we focusing on the physical um, needs and the health, need, we're not only focusing on health and physical needs of our students or our community, but we are focusing on also the social emotional connection. So everything we do has all the different parts of health so that they're fully um like they're truly healthy, all the different aspects. So our we call it our. Um, mind, heart, body here. It's our language of catch, um, if you're familiar with that. Um, so we add in this social emotional connection and we play, I chose quick draw for a reason. We don't know what's coming at us. Were we the same? Were we different? Um, and if, and that's the case, the same thing goes for um, continuing health, right? This is healthy, but now it's not healthy. Oh, tobacco, smoking, um, we're focusing on that, right? Now there's a shift with vaping. We're constantly having to adapt to these things. Um, so our question for today that I want you to think about is how can we adapt to changing situations? Really thinking about that. Um, so as you're just really thinking, what can we do physically? What can we do uh, educationally? What can we do mentally to adapt to these changing situations? And you're welcome to use the chat. Like how do you, and it can be both professionally and in your life. How do you adapt to changing situations, right? You're on your way to work and you're like, you're stuck in traffic. Uh oh, I'm gonna be late. How can we adapt to that? Or just really thinking, um, even with vaping, right? So now we're switching to more of these like jewels or the kind of uh, electronical devices. How can we adapt to that? So if you wanna go ahead and just take a second in your mind, like where are we that with that and how can we adapt to those changes? Um, you're welcome to use the chat. What is one way that you adapt? breathing. Good. I've been trying to do that too. The other day I was like, I had too much coffee and I was everywhere and I had to like take a breath and all my hands are cold because it was kind of cold too. So I had to, I've heard, so like there's something, if you put something cold on your body, naturally you're, you'll calm. So like I had to do that myself. So I, I, I've been trying to do um, a wellness Wednesday with my kids every week because it's like the one day we don't have to like rush too much after school and go to things. And so I'll just, you know, put, you know, some essential oil things on like kind of the lavender oil and just, you know, we do like, I'll have them practice breathing. And it, it honestly reminds me throughout the week, because I've been trying to work with them to do it to like, if I'm getting a little stressed or, you know, like I'm running late and there's like, okay, just turn the music off in the car. Let's breathe for a minute. So I, I it, truly does help if we can, you know, practice those and, and teach our kiddos to do it as well. So yeah. absolutely. I love, I love that as a strategy for, um, yeah, uh, breathing and just, uh, our family likes to, to just take a walk together and, you know, that's how, that's how we like to relax. So, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. 
Uh, Eliana, thank you so much for spending some time with us this morning. It was a great break. Um, and uh, what uh, I'm going to do now is um, give everybody, it's about 11.05, going to give everybody about um, 10 to 12 minutes to go um, take a small walk if you'd like, uh, grab some caffeine if you're cold, maybe a little cup of coffee, um, some water, um, and uh, let everybody please meet back um, around 11.15 or so. We'll start doing a mic check to make sure everything is working. Um, and we, uh, we will kick back off with an amazing panel um, that we have scheduled um, that kind of helps us think about where, where are we going moving forward with our school health issues. Thank you, Ileana. Thank you for having me. And I put my email in the chat. Um, I know you had you wanted more information about CAT. You're welcome to email me. Um, and also if you go to catch.org, I mean, like uh, in our website and I'll send the uh -huh. link there too, you're also able to get more information on what is CATCH and our different programs that we have available from our Catch My Breath all the way to um, PE journeys, health journeys, SEL journeys, everything that we offer, educators club. Um, so. You're welcome. Perfect. Yeah. So thank yes. you. Please put, all, please put all that information in our chat box. Absolutely. Yes. Right. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.
Welcome back, everybody. We're going to just do a quick mic check. Can everybody still hear me? Yeah, perfect. Super. Okay. We're waiting on one more panelist to join. Okay. I. Hey, Karen. She uh, just texted me that she's running a smidge behind, um, but she should hop on pretty soon. So we can just do some introductions, I guess, mm -hmm. and then loop her in when she gets on. Of course, of course. Yeah, we've got we've got another minute or two. I just wanted to make sure everybody's mics were working and that uh, we were able to, to hear everyone. Mindy, can you say hey? Hi, can y'all hear me? Yes. Perfect. Micah? Yes, ma'am. I can hear you loud and clear. Perfect. Perfect. And we can hear you. So that's awesome. wonderful. Okay. All right, well, to kick us off, I'll go ahead and um, just express uh, appreciation to all of our panelists um, for joining us today. Um, Y'all are kind of our grand finale, if you will, uh, as, uh, as we are kind of rounding off our conference, our two-day conference. Um, yesterday, we started the day um, with um, a really frank, open, and rich discussion from panelists on, you know, where, where things were um, kind of uh, where they saw, they, they, they brought to the table lots of different perspectives from, you know, a counselor's view to a nutritionist view to, um, you know, a school nurse. It was just, um, and, and a, a physical education coordinators um, sort of views of where schools are. Um, and that's such a valuable um, perspective to have. And then as we rounded off the day yesterday, we got to hear from a number of youth across the state of Texas. We had youth joining us from the valley around Laredo. We had those from the more um, Dallas area. We heard from a rural county. We heard from, you know, more of an East Texas voice as well. Um, and I think the value in that, again, was that we could get their perspective on, on where the state and situation was and, and get their input on, on maybe changes or, or how they see their voice matters. And so I think it's only fitting that as we move into kind of the, the conclusion of our conference, that throughout this entire summit, we have kept in mind the fact that parents and family voice um, and community voice is also very important and part of the solution um, to all of our school health issues. And so one of our presenters yesterday, speakers made a comment about it really is um, important that we have this interdisciplinary sort of approach that we're all getting out of our silos, if you will, because if there was one positive that came out of all of the COVID chaos that we all lived through was that in a school setting in particular, we have learned that we, we have to get out of our silos and start to find more creative, innovative ways that we can all come together 
to work towards um, the overall goal of improving our, our school health, our children's health, our staff health. And so um, I think that this panel that we have convened this afternoon to kind of close out the conference um, will bring that those different perspectives to light. And so I am honored to be turning over the moderating of our session um, to one of our steering committee uh, members, uh, Ms. Karen Burnell, um, who is our Texas PTA um, director at large and has worked with our Healthy Lifestyles um, and Shacks, um, and is just a, a, another one of our amazing rock star um, talk steering committee members. And so, Karen, I'm going to turn things over to you and I'll let you do some introductions and, uh, and kind of move us through our session. All right. Well, thank you, Alice. Um, and that was a great recap leading up to this because I do, I agree, um, you know, that whole child model when it sort of um, uh, tweaked a couple of years ago and they took the family involvement and um, community involvement and separated it into two separate areas. I thought that spoke volumes for the importance that parents play in that whole child model. So um, absolutely um integral in that process so uh just a little introduction about myself i uh do represent the texas pta i have been their healthy lifestyle liaison for whew, <laughs> quite a few years now they don't have a term limit on that um but i actually came into the texas pta because i met somebody who was serving at the time on the board um and my children were not even in school yet. I had a two-year-old and I was pregnant. She's like, oh, hey, you might be interested in this. <laughs> not really knowing PTA yet, but um, health and wellness has been my background for uh, 22 years now. So I've served, uh, I've, I've been a PE teacher. I've been a district coordinator where I serve as that district co-facilitator on SHACs. I've been a research coordinator for the UT School of Public Health involved with their CATCH program research. Um, so it was that background that kind of looped me into the healthy lifestyle liaison position with Texas PTA. But as my kids have grown and I am more involved in my local PTA now, I uh, am now serving on my uh, Richardson ISD shack where my uh, kids do attend. So it's definitely kind of come full circle. And where my passion has always been um, with the school systems and educating um, and, and, you know, health and wellness within school curriculums. I am truly, truly passionate now about educating parents because it was very eye-opening to see how many parents, they don't know what they don't know. And now that I'm in those trenches and it's, here's another newsletter or another worksheet coming home in a Tuesday folder, I can't keep up. And so how can we do a better job informing parents that uh, a school health advisory council is hopefully present within their district, that they are required by state law, that they have this avenue to share their voice, then that we help educate them through either, you know, PTO, PTA, however we can connect those dots between the great things that the district is doing and how the parents can support it. And just to kind of reiterate what Alice said, really kind of seeing that full circle because you know, knowing that I know some of the supply chain issues that child nutrition has faced, people kind of know me as a healthy lifestyle, you know, chick at the school. And they'll ask me, well, what can you do about, you know, the, um, the, the lunches? And I'm knowledgeable enough to explain to them, like, look, the, you know, yes, they're, they're not perfect, but X, Y, Z, this is what they've been facing. These are the federal guidelines that they have to follow. This is stricter than the McDonald's, you know, sodium <laughs> guidelines. So um, I, I think the more knowledgeable and, and, and groups that we can bring into that, um, we can help then to just, you know, educate other parents. So long-winded explanation, but I am very passionate about parent education now. Um, and we have a wonderful panel today of some SHAC members. So um, I'm going to just briefly introduce them and their district, and then I'm going to let them tell a little bit more about themselves. So we have... Um, Mindy Petty um, from Georgetown ISD. We have Micah, uh, I hope I'm saying this right, Holcomb. Uh, and she is a SHAC member with the Milam County and Texas Agri-Life um, Extension Agency. 
And then I believe she's, like I said, I, she, she was texting me earlier. Uh, joining us will be Angela Dunford, also a SHAC member from the Frisco ISD. So uh, since we're still waiting on Angela, I'm going to go ahead and look, um, turn it over to Mindy to just tell us a little bit about yourself and your involvement with your SHAC in your district. Sure. Hey, everyone. Um, my name is Mindy Petty. I actually am the chair of our SHAC. Um, this is my first year doing it. My co-chair is Dave Rainey, who is our um, guidance counselor um, director, and he has been a wonderful, wonderful mentor because I would never want to take Shaq on by myself without knowing anything. Um, I've been with the district for going on nine years. Um, I've been a nurse for 22 years. My role in the um, district is coordinator of health services. Um, my background's ICU, ER, and then I came to school nursing, which I never thought I would do, but it has been the most rewarding thing I've done, actually, as funny as that is. I still have kids who see me in the community, and they'll be like, Nurse Petty! Um, I was not involved in the shack as a parent. I didn't even really know the shack existed as a parent. Um, and I hate to say that because I feel like I'm a very involved parent. Um, I have a 20-year-old who's at A&M and then a senior and a, and a sophomore within our district, but I literally didn't know about Shaq. So um, I feel it's really important for parent engagement um, so their voices are heard. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just going into the fire my first year as the chair and we'll see how it goes from there. See, but Shaq's need more parents like you just say, yeah, I'll just get in there and do it. So, uh, but I think that reiterates that I, you know, we, there's so many things to keep up with. So, you know, that's just, we got to keep going and, you know, educating and so that more people do find out about it. So that's awesome. Thank you, Mindy, for sharing. All right, Micah, I'm going to turn it over to you. All righty. Can y'all hear me okay? All good? Um, I'm Michael Holcomb, and I work with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, and I'm the Family and Community Health Extension Agent in Milam County. Um, I've actually been in Extension for 17 years, so I did shack back in a very small county, Briscoe Hall County is up in the north, um, and that's when I first got introduced to shack and then um, I've always loved it. I thought it's wonderful. I love doing um, the thing, uh, shack and then um, when I came here to Milam County um, back in 2014-15, um, uh, they needed a president, and I stepped right in, and I've been it since then. Um, I'm also been PTO uh, president for seven years um, on my local PTO and chamber president and all that, all the above. <laughs> um, but I love You're all the hats. <laughs> Yes, I do. It's funny because every time I go in the school, I'm like, okay, so I have my work hat on today. Okay, today's the chamber hat. Today's the PTO hat. And it just kind of goes from there. But um, uh, Shaq, I love it with all my art. It works perfectly. And I'll talk about it in a little bit with your questions that you have about how I love how extension and Shaq works just so perfectly together. Um, but um, it's just been great. I have a, I have twins that are seven in second grade, and then I have an 11 year old that's in sixth grade. So um, I, and I, and I actually just did a food nutrition lesson while ago at the school. Um, that's why I've just been able to get on, but I did a thing on uh, fruits and vegetables and they got all little halo orange, cutie orange, um, reminding them to eat their oranges during the holidays to keep their vitamins up. So um, yeah. yeah, just love it. Love nutrition. So love to teach it especially Thanks, to Mike. the babies yeah so the, they soak it up right they, they actually listen um, oh yeah they were so excited it was so much fun and and they're the cutest ever because they're like I love your earrings I love your necklace I'm like oh I need to come see y'all more often I love those compliments <laughs> I saw something a while back that it was a kindergarten class that had a dial in number like if you just needed to hear some you know good thoughts for the day and it was sort of like a pre-recorded you know kindergarten leaving you a message voice I was like oh that's brilliant <laughs> yes totally totally yeah these were my pre-k four kids so yeah they were really all about it <laughs> thank that's you weird. for having me I, uh, I just to piggyback on that, be, you know, speaking with nutrition, we've started sort of a uh, PTA is about to kind of launch it. I've been piling it at my school, but it's uh, just going in once a month, getting parent volunteers. So any PTO, PTA could do it, but um, awarding veggie stickers, I mean, tickets. And so if kids are eating their veggies, they get a little ticket, they get to write their name on the back. And then through each grade level, we collect them. And then the counselor draws 
one name per grade level and that class gets an extra recess uh, that month. And so it's super easy, doesn't cost any money, promotes, you know, vegetable consumption and even the sixth graders. So this is where, you know, the little ones are more excited. Sixth graders, oh, come on, eat it, eat that vegetable. It's an extra chance for us to win recess. So um, it was very positive for me to see the, the excitedness in the older kids because you don't normally see that. So, um, but yeah, nutrition's a passion of mine as well. So, um, all right, I see Angela is on. Uh, thank you. She was delayed at a doctor's appointment. So we're very glad that you're able to make it, Angela. And so if you could go ahead, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Are you not unmuting? Do I need to unmute you? Let's see. Where did you go? There we go. Sorry. We go. Okay. My phone's being weird. Um, thank you guys. And I apologize for the delay. Uh, yeah, had the okay. doctor's appointment that was going long this morning. So, um, yeah, a little about myself, uh, Angela Dunford, and I should have put my name in here. Are you guys seeing my name or no? Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> um, I am with Frisco ISD. Um, so I've done four years on the shack. Um, this year I switched to a different committee, but, um, I shack is like where my heart is. I'll be honest. Um, so I've been able to do a lot there and also, um, so yeah, my role has been primarily just as a parent being involved there and lots of work with the PTA, uh, Angela, the recess expert. Yes, that's me. Yes, she is. <laughs> that's my, that's my thing. Um, and, uh, yeah, sort of my claim to fame has been being able to get a second recess for our elementary kiddos in our district. Um, but yeah, I've done two years as the healthy lifestyles chair. That's the, the cap. So, um, I wasn't able to do that again this year, um, at my school, but I'm continuing to stay involved with the PTA. I've worn a lot of, a lot of PTA hats over the years. So, yeah. Um, I don't know what else you want to know about me, I guess, um, professionally, I've uh, done drug development research in a, a lab environment for a pharmaceutical company for a lot of years. So I kind of, you know, health seems to be weaving its way in and out of my life in a lot of different ways, both professionally, but also with my kids and um, as a parent in the schools. I think that that just kind of happens, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Angela. And thank you all of you for sharing um, just a little bit about yourselves. Obviously, you, we've got some, you know, some nursing, health services, nutrition, passion, physical activity, passion in this panel. So super exciting to have all of your backgrounds here and, and just your passion for serving um, on the shack. So I'm going to start with a uh, first question for the group. And it's just obviously coming off everything that we've been talking about with the pandemic. So as um you know you you just kind of review the past two years with your shack and and let me actually just stop right there the for those who are on the call and may not know because we've said shack a lot that is your school health advisory council <laughs> didn't really introduce what that was um each district should have a shack and it should be 50% parents. Um, I say should a lot because, um, you know, districts do find uh, complications in getting that parent involvement. If it's a smaller rural district, they may not really have one. Um, a lot of the times, if you, you know, check on your district's website, it's going to fall either under the health and, phys health and physical activity department, health services department, or child nutrition. Generally, one of those areas serves as that district facilitator or coordinator and then they have to have a parent co-chair. So again, this is by law that they bring recommendations to the board and that doesn't mean the board has to listen to those recommendations, but they have they provide an annual report on pretty thing pretty much all things health related. So everything from human growth and sexuality curriculum to uh, recess policies. So um, anything health related does need to be uh, vested through your shack. So if they're adopting a new curriculum, um, you know, obviously with the new health teaks that came out, all the shacks were looking at new textbooks last year and such. So um, that that's just a, you know, quick 
uh, background of what a, a shack does. So with that being said, okay, so back to just the pandemic and coming off your shack involvement. Um, how has the pandemic, you know, affected, uh, either helped or hurt the work of your shack? So um, I'm going to go back and start with Mindy on this question. Um, um, so when the pandemic hit, as crazy as it sounds, we went to virtual meetings. And when we went to virtual meetings for our district, our participation went from almost nobody at an in-person meeting to full virtual meetings with everyone attending. It was kind of crazy. We actually thought we'd get less attendance, but we didn't. So the pandemic actually helped our shack to get re like revitalized. People were involved. I have doctors and I have community members that all have full-time jobs um, and different part parents and, and everyone's able to meet these virtual meetings. So for us, it was really wonderful. Um, it also kind of changed how we were approaching our safety. So with Shack, we had a safety committee, um, but then the state mandates, we have an open forum safety committee that has community members and district members. And so we actually took that committee out of our Shack and we're actually just using that as our um, safety committee for our actual district. Um, but so far, I mean, I mean, the pandemic really brought to light. It gave a voice to our medical um, subcommittee. You know, there were, we were making really difficult decisions that not everyone agreed with. I mean, as you guys know, you all went through the pandemic. Um, you know, schools were very divided on wear a mask, don't wear a mask, go in person, don't go in person. And so I really do feel that the shack gave our medical subcommittee a voice. Um, and so it was really, it was a good experience for us. So that's awesome. I mean, I, you, I've heard a lot that the virtual kind of really, you know, increase the numbers. Um, are y'all still meeting virtually or do you have y'all done a hybrid? Are you back in person? Um, uh, we actually had sent out kind of a survey to our shack and they prefer to meet virtually just because it gives us the ability to have more participation. Yeah. Um, and, and the whole point of shack is to get this diverse amount of, you know, diverse population that's giving input, right? Like we don't want a one-sided input. We want all of our members to be able to, to give input. So we have kept them virtual for now. Okay. That may change. It may not. We'll kind of have to see. Yeah, as long, I think as long as your numbers stay up and you've got the involvement, if it's working for you, don't rock it, right? <laughs> All right, uh, Micah, same question for you. How did the pandemic affect your shack? All right, um, so on our shack, um, before, I think it just made us overall just re-pivot and think about different strategies and thoughts. So it's actually helped us out. Um, we were meeting after school, which wasn't really a good time. Um, but we decided let's change it up and start meeting at noon. And this was kind of more toward the end when we started being able to. And we met at the high school and we actually started adding two high school kids per grade. And so we actually have two, two students per grade, 9, 10, 11, 12 on our shop awesome. committee. And they come to our meetings. We have lunch. We meet. Um, we get to get their insights. So like even the other day we talked about, you know, what, we asked the high school kids, what vaping, where, where do you think the kids need it? What grade do they need it more for vaping curriculum? And so they are able to give us their input, which is really great. They help us with programs. Um, also, a lot of them have to have community service hours for NHS. So it's a great way to get both kind of think smarter, not harder. Yeah. Um, another thing real quick on ours that um, we pivoted on and changed up, which was really great on our programming. Um, through AgriLife Extension, we provide a program called Walk Across Texas. Um, I don't know if many of y'all know about some, quite a few may know about it, but um, you get in a team of eight and you walk um, across Texas, 832 miles. And um, through COVID and the pandemic, um, it made us think, okay, what programs can we do in our schools to do health and nutrition and physical activity but not be able to not go in the schools and teach some of that. How can we do it? And walk across Texas fit that need exactly. And so we started doing that. And then this year we did our huge, uh, we have a rival between our other school, Cameron and Rockdale, um, called Bow the Bell, if you've ever heard about it. And we have a bell and they battle it out on the football field. So we did a walk across Texas Battle of the Bell competition. 
And um, it was great because they can do it in their schools and the recess. And, you know, with the pandemic, that was what we kind of transitioned to. And it gives us an opportunity to really reach everybody in the school district and people know about it. And I even saw a kid the other day at Spirit Shop for PTO still wearing his pedometer. So I was like, yes, we won there. Um, so it's really been a great opportunity to reach even more from thinking about other ideas since at that time we couldn't go in the schools and teach. We were able to do that and people could, kids could still take part in all of our youth and health programs that way. So I hope that answered your question. There. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, um, we, and we still have our, me we now have our meetings completely in person. So. In person okay. Yeah, we moved back to in person as well, um, but we don't, we don't meet on a campus. It's more a, a, a central office, a satellite building. Um, and and it, that's still one of my goals is to get those student members. We don't have that. But again, I think that can be so critical in driving some of those decisions that the, the SHAC actually makes and those recommendations to the board taken a little bit more seriously. So yeah, kudos to that. That's awesome. And I'm also, I'm sorry to input one more thing. Um, I'm actually on the Rockdale Shack too. So okay. we work together and that's been kind of one of my goals is to, you know, have Rockdale and Cameron Shacks working together and get all of our shacks together, kind of like a shack council. Yeah. So oh, I love that. Working on that. So that's been a really great thing because we all work together to do this walk across Texas and the Rockdale Shack, they do theirs half and half virtually and in person. Okay. Oh yeah. A, a nice hybrid. I like that too. Yes. All right. Thank you. All right, Angela, same question to you. Pandemic. Uh, how did it y'all? Yeah, I think a, a same with a lot of things with the pandemic. Um, I was thinking back, um, I feel like it kind of derailed some things. We were starting to get some good momentum building on, um, a couple of really cool initiatives and it kind of was like oh never mind we're gonna drop that you know we we had just done our first district-wide health fair um, that was a massive success the year before and it was a ton of effort and so there was a lot of like okay we've got some lessons learned and now let's do this again next year oh never mind <laughs> and then again the following year we were going to but it was still kind of on the fence so then never mind and now at this point, I'd be surprised if it gets kind of revitalized, you know, so the, that was kind of sad um, with, you know, I was still in the middle of a lot of recess advocacy as well. And part of my big thing with that is the um, how important social connection is for kids. You know, that was something I was pushing before we were even talking about what, how is the pandemic going to impact kids? You know, there wasn't a, a pandemic at that point. Um, so then all of a sudden it's like, you know, I had a few things I still was wanting to push and it was like, oh, this isn't the year to do it. You know, yeah. let's just get through this year. This isn't the year to really come down hard and say, no, let's tighten this up. You know, it's like, no, this is the year for grace. Um, so it did delay some things and, um, you know, that was unfortunate. So some of those we've been able to get back on track. Some of the things have kind of fallen by the wayside, but <clears throat> you know, overall, I think uh, probably similar impact to what a lot of different organizations experienced. Right? And I think, you know, like you said, you put it on the back burner. It's not necessarily gone. They can come yeah. back to it. But um, right. so to remind, did y'all stay virtual or are you back in person? Um, we went virtual just for one year and now we're back to just in person. No okay. call-ins. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Um, all right, so looking at our next question, for e from each of your different perspectives, what do you see as the major role that SHACs can play in helping schools uh, with healthier learning environments? Because I think all SHACs can sort of have that different focus, you know, what are their major um, needs that they're looking and addressing in their districts, and they can be very vastly different across the state. So Specifically from your shack and your community, what do you think is the major role your shack is playing right now? Um, and I'll just kind of take a show of hand. I won't call on somebody who would like to answer that one first. All right, Mindy, go ahead. Uh -oh. um, I, I think I kind of come from both, both perspectives, right? I am a parent, but I'm also co-chair of the shack. And so I think our main thing, our shack is that the most important thing they can do is advise our board to the specific issues that are that are in, 
for our district individually. Um, I find that as a co-chair, some of our SHAC members think we're an action committee versus an advising committee. And I feel like that kind of creates some problems at times, um, unfortunately. And so I'm really trying this year to focus on our SHAC saying, at the end of the year, we get to make these recommendations to the board. We can have facts, figures, data. We can have examples. Like we can really take these things and present our passion and of what we need to do to make our district as a whole healthier. Um, and so that's what our my main focus has been is just really being that advising counsel to our board and making sure that our board understands that our work really does represent our community as a whole. And I think, like you said, getting those the data, the stats and figures specific, if you can, to mm -hmm. your community can really speak volumes to them. They do they perk up a little bit. They're going to little you know listen to those recommendations a little bit more if you can truly pre present some local data, evidence based programs that work. So right. So actually, for our shack, one of our main things this year is substance abuse, obviously. And so I know what we're using in our district. Um, and now hearing all about the catch program, like that's something I'm going to bring to that committee and be like, have you checked this out? Here's their website and get more information. Um, and for our shack, like we have literally 50, we want 50% from one feeder pattern, 50% from the other, where they're parents or community members. So we really do get that full effect of what the community wants. Um, and I think that's a really important driving force because as you know, sometimes when you have lower socioeconomic parents, they're working, they can't participate They're, you know, and so we really definitely want to open it up to absolutely everyone that can participate so their voices are heard. Awesome. No, totally agree. All right, Micah or Angela. I see Angela's okay. unmuted. You want to go ahead? And okay. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I think that um, you know, there's a, there's a few places that I think our shack has had the greatest impact. So that's where I'm going to kind of take your question. Um, I think um, doing, we've come up with a lot of creative little initiatives. Like I said, that district health fair or um, just little programs throughout the year where we can say, let's put on this event and educate parents in the community. So that's something where we have a lot of Kind of what Mindy is saying, we don't have necessarily a ton of authority to just say, here's what the whole district is going to do. What we do have a lot of ability to just go and act is in creating events. And so that's something that we've been able to do. Um, we did that documentary screening that Karen was a part of that was really awesome. Um, so there's a few different things that we kind of get excited and we put those things on. Um, I would say the other place um that we that, that I have found to be pretty impactful is in really working that wellness plan so um the state requires in addition to the state requiring every single district in Texas to have a shack um they also require you to have a wellness policy and with that a supporting wellness plan it's very vague there's some things that it says it has to have in there but just you have to have one. Okay, so um, so knowing we have to have one, well, well, what can we put in there? You know, is kind of what how I've taken that. And that comes up for a refresh every few years. It's supposed to be updated. And I think that it often gets overlooked in a lot of shacks. Like, oh, we've got this old document. Has anybody ever looked at it? Is anyone ever going to look at it? Do we care about it? Now let's just sign it off and say we read it and move on when really you can use that um, as a very strong positioning to recommend, this is how we think our district should operate, even more so than just a verbal recommendation to the board to say, we're gonna put all this in our wellness plan and you know, is it legally binding? No, but um, you know, some of the things that we were able to put in there this last year was um, things like ensuring every child has 20 minutes seated to eat their lunch. <laughs> so long lunch lines have become an issue, especially during the pandemic, right? Um, where kids sometimes, um, if they only have 10 minutes to sit down, oh, sorry, um, and eat, they're not gonna eat their veggies, you know? <laughs> and they're not gonna eat much of their lunch at all, actually. 
Um, so things like that, um, things like formalizing a little more what we want that second recess to look like and ensuring that it's taken every day and uh, what the minimum requirements are for that, that it needs to be. Kids go outside just like they would for their regular recess. Um, so really, I, there were a lot of things I had worked with our board for a long time to try to just get them to tighten up these really common sense things and just put some wording to it. They were very hesitant to do that. And so then when it was time for the wellness plan to come up, it's like, let's put all this in here and see what happens. And we, you know, and it was voted on unanimously and accepted by the board, you know? So it's like, sometimes it just has to go through the right route. Um, and then that gives, that document I think is helpful because I've had a lot of parents ask me, hey, you know, this is happening with my kids recess because I'm known for that. Or, you know, this is going on. And I say, ah, we actually have a district document that's on the district website and there's verbiage that's been approved by the board. Show this to your teacher or show this to your principal. A lot of times they just don't know, right? And then all of a sudden, some of those little issues that really, all, you know, go boil down all the way to the student individual level, those, those little issues that can come up, they'll start getting resolved. And that's what I love seeing. So um, that's been a pretty powerful tool, I think. Um, and then also we, since, you know, we originally had one recess per day and they piloted for a while doing a second recess before it was adopted district-wide, that pilot initially went through the shack as well. So that was another place where our shack had an opportunity to have a really important impact was in directing that pilot and analyzing the data, sending out the surveys, and then making that case that we think this is a good thing for all kids. Awesome, awesome. I think, yeah, just to, you know, um, reiterate a couple of things you said, you know, piloting things, piloting programs is always a good way to tiptoe in. Um, yeah. And your events, uh, you know, like you mentioned that, and that's, again, you know, I'm, I'm writing down things as y'all are talking to you that, because uh, I'm newer to the Richardson um, Shack versus when I worked with the DISD Shack, and you, you, we don't do events. And I think, yeah, just starting small, a small thing, and you start adding it in and they see value and worth to it other than just making those recommendations. Um, but, to, and just to uh, touch back on the wellness policy. Yes. For those of y'all who don't know, uh, it's a triennial review. So every three years it's supposed to be reviewed. And this, like she said, when I was with DIC, we would have about 60 new principals a year that we were presenting to. And if we could get five minutes on that, you know, agenda at the beginning of the year to try to cover all these things that were health and wellness, they, they just don't know. So if it's in that wellness policy, like she said, it's not legally binding, but it's, you know, it's, it's a district policy. Look, this is what we're doing. So they honestly may not know that and educating that principal may just be as simple as showing them that document. So, uh, yes, wonderful, um, uh, roles that the shot can play in, in, in a variety of ways to mention. So, all right, I'll finish it out with Micah. Anything else to add to that? I know they've covered a lot. Yeah, they did. Um, actually, uh, I was going to say about the same thing Angela was talking about. We use the wellness policy for a lot of our framework of what we're going to do in our shack. And so um, uh, the wellness policy to us is, you know, a guide and and how do we an outline of, OK, well, we need to cover this. We need to work on these events. And as you all know, you know, small towns. Um, we focus a lot on our football and we focus a lot about our other stuff. And so the when I see the major role of Shaq is to um, think about their student health. And also one thing that we do really well in our district is um, staff develop, staff um, wellness. So really working on employee wellness. Um, we do a uh, employee staff wellness health fair um, the, the day we go back after New, uh, New Year's and um, giving them some, uh, you know, we do an in-spot workshop, we do meal prep to teach them about cooking at home. We also teach them about, we do health screenings at that for our staff wellness. So that's been one of the things that on our major role of our shack is to um, not only worry about student health, um, but also our staff health. Cause if they're healthy, 
then, um, you know, they're able to stay and be able to teach well and feel well and, and do a great job teaching our students. So um, that's one of our major roles is, is that as well. But I feel like the wellness policy is kind of our best framework and outline. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. There you go. Touching on another topic, staff wellness, so important. And when our staff feels healthier, they feel more inclined to talk about health and integrate health into those core subjects, right? So uh, very still much part of that whole child model. All right. I'm looking at time because we have quite a few questions still here. So I'm just, um, uh, I may skip around a little bit. Um, Okay. Um, what resources and support do you think shacks across the state need to be more engaged and supportive of child health? So any resources, I know we just talked a lot about the wellness policy, but any other, um, you know, district created ones, other, you know, AgriLife Extension, what other resources um, do you, and support do you think they need? Micah? Um. Yes, uh, AgriLife Extension, we have a lot of curriculum. There's county extension agents in every single county of the state, and they're a great resource to bring in because uh, we have all these things that we can get. I'm actually doing a presentation to our new agents on Friday on opening your door and putting your foot in to ISDs, and I'm talking about Shaq at that. Yeah. And um, so I feel like AgriLife, we provide so many um, free opportunities, um, free curriculum that we can provide to our schools. We also have a really neat thing I have to tell you about. I'm really excited about, but it's called a healthy school recognized campus. And so you do a checklist of different things that are going on through extension and through your shack committees, and you can actually be recognized as a healthy recognized campus. So um, it's something you can talk to your county extension agent about in your county. And um, it's really neat to get a nice banner, they get recognized and it's just, it's so cool. That's something I'm really pushing for our shacks this year is to be a healthy, um, recognized campus. So, um, and you can do that as an ISD or as an actual smaller campus, um, elementary or whatnot, kind of up to you. But I love it because shacks can do that. So, um, but yeah, we have so many curriculum opportunities all the way from pre-K all the way up to 12th. And we do like you were saying, substance abuse. We have vaping specialists. We have Miss Alice. She does a lot of um, uh, of our school wellness stuff. Um, she's amazing um, and has a lot of great resources there. Um, so there's a lot of different um, opportunities and resources that AgriLife can provide. So I, I just love it, and it's so exciting. And we have a lot of freebies. Yes, you do. <laughs> um, but yeah, and I'm just going to pay you back on that because uh, Texas PTA, we're actually in in talks. Um, Alice and I have been back and forth. We just, you know, got to get finished getting planned. But Texas PTA also launched a series of parent education programs, short video vignettes from content experts that can be led by a parent facilitator to uh, on a you know variety of discussions from vaping to uh, mental health to human trafficking, to uh, Votex schools and such. So it's, it's, again, ways to educate parents. And so we've part, or we're trying to, you know, finalize this to partner with AgriLife Extension on, again, just the, making those healthier choices, you know, how to shop health, smarter at the grocery store, how to shop healthier on a budget, um, and giving parents those tools. So, again, funneling that information through your shack, like, hey, here are parent programs that are out there that we can bring in, but that every... Um, every county has that AgriLife Extension Agency. And so, you know, if they do one thing, then it could just kind of snowball into maybe other schools and or PTAs, you know, hearing this information from the shack and then bringing it in either to a feeder pattern or to, you know, a couple of surroundings, you know, elementary schools in the community. So, uh, yeah, so I just wanted to reiterate that they have an uh, extension agent, um, an agent in every county. So, uh, thank you, Micah. Um, Angela, I see you're unmuted, so I'll go ahead and go to you. Sure. Sorry, I'm having a hard time with my mute and unmute. So oh, okay. I'm <laughs> no worries. I'm going to leave myself unmuted the whole time. Um, yeah, I'll try to be brief, but um, resources that I think we could use that we don't have already. Um, you said state level resources. Um, three things come to mind. First of all, better legislation. Um, I think protecting health in general, but 
certainly recess. Um, we don't have any law in Texas requiring recess at all, actually. Um, so that would be just to have something where, okay, we have a, a starting point <laughs> for some of that stuff that, okay, now districts can say, are we even meeting this requirement or not? Um, another thing, I think the TSHAC website has mm -hmm. a lot of really, really cool resources on it. It just feels hard for me uh, visually. It's not super, it's, I wish it were a little better organized. I wish it was easier to find um, some of those sample recommendations, you know, or um, what's the word? It starts with an R, resolutions. Resolutions. Um, um, also, I think on the TSHAC website, it would be nice. They have, they give guidelines for things to put in your bylaws, but if they had an actual sample bylaw, that would be really helpful for us. Um, and then, um, oh gosh, what was one other thing I was just going to say? I'll let you know if I think of it, but those were, those were some of the things I thought of that would be helpful. Um, and I just saw a question pop up and I will, um, Try, I'll pull that here in a second, but the T-Shack website, if you just probably Google T-Shack, it'll come up and that stands for Texas Shack. And so that is just a group that's, again, from around the state, they come in to sort of, again, provide guidelines, like Angela said. They also, one of their resources that I provided to my shack this year is just sample meeting topics, right? And it's alphabetical and it gives you anything under the sun. Um of what, you know, hey, what do we want to focus on this year? And just because we're on the Texas Action for Healthy um, Kids Summit, they also have some establishing priorities checklists as well. So, um, and uh, Michelle, they've started up the Shock Network uh, through a variety of partners. And so that also has a lot of great um, uh, resources as well. So I will try to get on and, and put those two websites in um, here in just a minute. So, all right, Mindy, is there anything else you want to add? Um, I mean, I think that they said it beautifully, like better legislation by far. I, being medical and a health expert, it frustrates me that not more emphasis is put on the health and nutrition and well-being of our kids as we have state testing. We have this, and I get it. We're in an, I work in an education environment, but I would love to see more emphasis on health um, for our kids and our students. Um, and also, like when you go to the TSHAC website, I really it is difficult to navigate and in just having something for parents of like a join shack 101 type of thing. And if it's out there, I just don't know about it, but just so parents don't feel so overwhelmed with, oh, I don't want to join the shack because I just don't have the time. I don't have this. It's too overwhelming. Just, just letting parents know that it, it isn't what they think it might be and that it's actually their voice being heard and, and whatnot. I think that would be a, a great resource for us as well. I'm trying to double duty and put and do a couple of things in chat as well. Um, but yeah, you know, I know Joel was on earlier and talking about legislative priorities this year and with, you know, just getting health back in as a graduation requirement. If your district does not have it because it, they it's not a state requirement anymore, a lot of districts did keep it as a health graduation requirement, but a lot did not. And so that's, if you're looking for a priority and your district does not have it as a graduation requirement, I would highly recommend you going that route as a priority because, um, in fact, we have it in Richardson. It's a local re requirement. And one of the things I'm really trying to start tiptoeing into is pushing for, you know, that middle school requirement, you know, that again, having it as an elective is great, but, you know, if we could have that as a required middle school course, again, I know it might be a pipe dream, but um, I, I think they, they, they need it uh, in middle school, but not just for the human growth and sexuality, so many other things. And then they need it again in high school. So taking um, high school health as a incoming seventh grader, I mean, incoming eighth grader, like summer of seventh grade scares me because I, yes, they need that information, but that's a long time that they're going to go without getting it. And some of it's a little above where they are. So I truly am a firm uh, proponent of middle school and high school, if we can get it back there. So Karen, this is Alice. I, yeah. I wanted to, I'm glad you jumped in on um, 
for anybody that joined us a little bit later, uh, uh, late this morning, um, earlier we did have Joel Romo uh, from Partnership for Healthy Texas um, uh, come on and provide uh, some comments about potential upcoming legislative priorities. And Angela, one of those did center around uh, recess. And mm -hmm. so um, what I would say is if you if you weren't able to be on earlier, um, you will have access to the recording. I would encourage you to go back and see what Joel had to say. And he also gave some great tidbits of how we can all get involved um, and and, you know, be a part of, um, you know, maybe getting some legislation pull, uh, pushed across the finish line this upcoming year. So for certain, you did mention that recess policy that failed a couple of years ago. It had yes. bipartisan support. It uh -huh. was really very yeah. frustrating. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know, 18th year of the charm. You know, <laughs> right. Okay, I'm going to turn it back over. Sorry, I just right, didn't no, want to miss that. I didn't want to miss that opportunity to highlight that. I think that uh, the conversation is heading in that direction, um, certainly from a number of um, state organizations and partners that are all trying to, to pull some of that together to go before the next legislative session. All right, so now, um, again, let's look at the time. Okay, let's just go, um, and I, I feel like this is might be maybe ending on a little bit negative, but maybe if we can talk about how we've overcome it as well. Uh, the question is, what are your biggest challenges your shack is facing at being effective? So, you know, maybe you've got an example of a challenge that you faced and overcame, um, or just, again, a challenge that you just can't quite get it across the finish line. What's something that you're, you're still battling? Anybody want to go ahead and go? Um, <laughs> You're unmuted. Go ahead and go. <laughs> all right. Yeah. You know, just, just chat, you know, um, I think um, while some districts struggle to get parent participation on their shack, that is not a challenge for us. Actually, we have a ton of parents that want to get involved on committee. So we are super lucky that way. Um, but where we do have a challenge in our shack, I feel is just like the I mean, maybe the organization is the way to put it. Um, ours tends to be very heavily district run. Um, and, you know, the way I read the spirit of the law on the shack is, hey, it's supposed to be more than 50% parent membership. And this is one of the only committees, maybe the only one I know of that's legally required to have a parent co-chair. So you're side by side in equal authority leading the shack. Um, we just have not had that, um, at least in execution. Um, even on paper, we had a, a district chair and a co-chair for a long time before I said, uh, I think the law says we're supposed to have a parent running this, you know. So then even once we got a parent, it was still, um, it was still, it was in title only, it felt. And so what I see happening a lot is parents kind of just show up and they don't feel as empowered to take initiative maybe and breach those topics that are really important to them. It's kind of like they are told, okay, here's what we are going to do. Here's what you, you know, here's the, the framework for what you're going to brainstorm. And even um, the shack membership never for never saw even the report that went to the board at the end of the year. And so there were a lot of things I've been trying to clean up to get it to the point where really our parents have that voice to say, no, this isn't what we want in our report. That's not how we discussed it. Or you're missing a really important thing that we kept bringing up. Why is that not in the report? Um, and to just get it to a point where I feel it's supposed to be it. Um, because it's more than 50% parent membership, it should be majority parents and so somewhat parent led with district support. And I'd love to see it kind of shift that way. That's where I think having some of the bylaws tightened up and having some of those, like I said, some of those resources to help us with that, I think would be good. Um, but I will say it's just been kind of chipping away at it. You know, you talk about making progress. And so I've kind of, okay, we got to the point where we now have a parent co-chair. Now let's get to the point where that co-chair functions as a co-chair, you know, and just kind of keep pushing and, and getting it to the point where 
it really is community led and it's a reflection of the community's values in, in what we value for health. Um, one other little um, hiccup I think we continue to encounter is there seems to be a, 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 a difference in how the district values digital learning versus how parents value it. The district very heavily values it and they are supporting us more and more digital, even post pandemic, whereas parents are saying, let's get away from that. I think that's not as good for mental health, you know? Um, and so that's a challenge we continue to face. And um, I don't know what the answer is there, but we just keep um, trying to bring it up and, and see if we can kind of nudge our district to go in a direction that is more reflective of the community's values with that, you know, just more balanced. Awesome. You, so you're meaning like I, iPad still being utilized in the classroom a little too yeah. much. Yeah, as right. Too. Or I just, you know, especially that. at the middle and high school level, vast majority of class period being spent Projects. on the yep. screen. Yeah. Even with a the teacher there in the classroom. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I, th I think we're facing that as well. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Same with you, though. I, I think it's that chipping away. It was, you know, members not really seeing the report that went to the report the board um you know not re really knowing it was like the rubber stamping of here's what the district is doing and so we yeah it's i think it's sort of that pendulum that swings and it's like okay now here's some ideas that the parents are bringing of uh, research-based programs that again they may or may not have been aware of and so they've got you know they're wearing so many hats as well so many balls up in the air so sometimes it is helpful to have the you know the information come from the parents right. about hey, here's a program I saw on a conference, yeah. you know, maybe we could check into this. So, yeah. And some of that, so, so much of that just comes down to education. I had no idea until I attend a PTA launch event and it was like, huh? Our shack is not doing things the way they're supposed to, you know, that yep. I think you were there. <laughs> That's like bold moment. And so just having things like this is just so helpful and just, um, you know, educating the community more on what the heck is a shack? what's it supposed to do, you know, yeah. and, and I think that naturally some of those things get resolved when the community becomes just a little more educated about it. And even the membership becomes more educated. Yeah. About sure. yeah. All right. Thank you, Angela. Um, Mindy, I see you're unmiked or unmuted. <laughs> so go ahead. I'm going to let you go next. <laughs> So our district has exactly the opposite of what Angela has. Oh, interesting. So we have a full shack with parents over 50%, but during our subcommittee meetings, it's the district liaison that they want to leave the work. And so I have explained over and over again, like we are here to just give you guidance, but you, this is time for you parents to have a voice. And, you know, you tell us what you're seeing and what you're wanting and, and what is your, what you think is the most important thing for our shack to present. But I, I created a Google document for my entire subcommittee. I put everything on it. I said, please input, give, um, give resources. Let's talk about this. Like, let's, let's make it a working document. Crickets. <laughs> nobody added anything. Nobody, like, at all. I sent reminder emails, nothing. And then we had the next shack meeting, and it was like, okay, Mindy, so, like, what's going on? And I'm like, no, I'm not the driving force. You guys are the driving force. Um, and it's not just my sub subcommittee, it's, it's all of our awesome. subcommittees is it's really the parents are on it, but they want the district liaisons to do the work. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I've come, I guess I've come from a different perspective and I wish I had, I, for us, the shack, like we vote on every single slide that goes to our board presentation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they are very, in our shack, they are very well aware of exactly what's going to the board. And we literally vote on each slide that goes to the board to make sure that it's collectively what the shack wants to say. But I would love for the parent and community members to take more of the driving force for our shack. We're just not there yet. Again, we're chipping away at it. So opposite problem, but still chipping away. So <laughs> still chipping away. I think we can all echo that. So um, uh, quick question. How many subcommittees do y'all have? Um, we have currently, we have mental health, medical health, and nutrition. So we have three. And before the okay. pandemic, like I said, we had our safety one. So currently we only have three right now. And so do y'all have, because there's also the requirement of a fiscal activity subcommittee. 
Oh yeah, we have, sorry. Okay. Yes, we do. We have physical <laughs> activity, nutrition, mental health, and medical. We have all four. Okay. Well, I was, you know, cause again, sometimes we just, it slips through the cracks. And so, um, I know ours didn't have it until I brought it up. And so we've added physical activity and then we're creating one this year that's sort of health and wellness with coordinated school health, because our coordinated school health program is no longer approved by TEA. And so looking to review new ones perhaps, um, but then also exploring that health recommendation that I mentioned. So yeah, we're, we're, again, this is, was baby steps for mine as well. And so we're definitely, you know, just starting with two. So I would love to have more. Those were awesome that you have so many. So, um, all right, Micah, you want to go ahead and bring it home with the biggest challenge yours is facing. Um, so I think our biggest, I mean, we're small. So again, y'all were like, oh, subcommittees. I'm like, um, but that's, it's so our, vastly different, Shack, right? Shack yeah. and Shack main committee. <laughs> um, we don't really have subcommittees. We're just really glad to be able to meet. Um, but uh, one of our biggest challenge, I think, was when I first got there, um, first of all, they didn't have a parent co person. So I stepped into that role automatically. So finding someone like that. And then um, also their events that, because we're more event based since we're so small. So we do a lot of our events and then just report to the school board. That's more of how we roll on that. Um, but um, the events that they were creating, they were creating all these extra events and doing all this extra work. And when I came in, I put the think smarter, not harder approach. And so we started doing them, you know, school with school things that were already happening. Um, and our attendances at our events, our buy-in of the community of wellness went just it skyrocketed because we were thinking smarter, not harder and not creating a whole nother event on a whole nother day and trying to get people at it. We were thinking, oh, well, if we do a community-wide cookout, free hot dogs for everybody. Well, let's do some physical activity games with them, you know? And so thinking ahead and not thinking about like creating and doing that. And our other one, and I know it sounds kind of crazy, but like our other challenge, and I think this kind of, you can't really control it, but I think a lot of it has to do with your assistant superintendent on your shack committee. Um, since we're so small, um, there, she's our advisor. And I think that that, truly has the biggest impact on your group because if she's excited and willing to help you get that shack going especially in a small town with the shack um if she has a great attitude and she's really excited the school board is all in on it the the teachers and staff that are on the shack are into it and then the parents and so our assistant superintendent we changed about one two years after I got on Shack, and she is just so excited about school health and I think that makes all the difference so at first our other one was like oh it's a checkbox let's check off check off check off and be done that's over um whereas this one our assistant superintendent she is just excited all the time about everything Shack. so that makes a huge difference on all the activities that we get to do because um, she's in it and then I'm excited and it just, it's a driving force for our group. So I think getting excitement and buy-in um, from that assistant superintendent and everybody um, just that helps a lot. So hopefully Absolutely. I covered that question. Yes. And see, I think you just brought a different perspective because here I am jealous thinking, what, you have an assistant superintendent on your shack? Like I have some district leadership, but not anybody that high. So, you know, I, I think, but you, the, the key takeaway I took from yours was that excitement, right? Find somebody with that vested interest, either if it's a school board member or an upper management, upper level um, district personnel and getting them to somebody who has the passion, understands that connection between healthier students are going to be more productive learners. And if they understand that connection, you've got that support then. And they're going to be more receptive to the recommendations you bring forward to them. They're going to be more excited to promote them and share them with their administrators and staff. So um, I do, I think, you know, getting, finding those vested um, interests. So. And that actually goes for our Rockdale Shack does the same thing. Um, both the assistant superintendents um, serve on the shacks and our advisors are both, and they're both excited, both campuses. So it really makes it fun to have both of them and it's great. They're both amazing. Awesome. Well, okay. I'm glad we ended with the word. The key takeaway there was excitement, right? <laughs> 
Um, so I do see that we are nearing the end of our time. Um, I just want to thank all three of you, Mindy, Micah, and Angela. I, I learned so much and I find that it was just such a, you know, breadth of diversity between physical activity, nutrition, uh, health services, smaller district, larger districts. So um, I hope everybody else that is still on, a, your, one, your troopers for still being on this last session, um, but two, that you had some takeaways as well, because I think we y'all kind of covered it all. There's really something for everybody probably that's on this call that could take away a, a nugget of information that they can go back to their own district with. So thank you very, very much. Um, I'm going to get some of your information so that I can keep following up with you as well throughout the rest of the school year. So um, thank you again. And I'm going to turn it back over to Alice to see if there's anything else that you wanted to follow up on before we close out. Sure. No, thank you so much, panel. Um, and thank you, Karen, for um, uh, uh, leading um, the, the discussion. I, I do think it was rich um, and some great ideas. Um, I'm sharing a, a screen. I want to make sure everybody can see my screen. Uh, Karen, can you all see the wrap up? Yes. OK, perfect. Yes. Okay, so what we want to do now is um, just quickly, I, I would love to hear some um, overall comments from um, kind of the day. What were some um, memorable moments? I mean, certainly this panel, but even um, beforehand, earlier on in today's presentations. Um, what are some of the the takeaways that y'all y'all had from either today or even yesterday for some of you that were on and attended both days. I want to I want to catch some of these comments. I want to be able to to pull some of these. Okay, I, I see in the chat that Micah said um, the idea of the the fruit and veggie tickets that uh, and. Uh, Karen, that's always been one of my favorites as well. Um, that uh, that y'all have uh, that you and the PTA group has been putting together the the stickers idea or the the just recognition for good sound nutrition choices. Um, I think that's always. Um, and I'll just add, uh, if I can, real quick recap mm -hmm. on that. Uh, this has truly been a process of narrowing it down. And I really think that we've kind of nailed it to where hopefully we can just create a couple of one pagers and share it out as a real simple thing that you can bring if you've got parent volunteers. But um we started with getting stickers and some of the older kids didn't like stickers, right? Um, we started with, okay, well, this month we'll try if they're eating their fruits. And next month was, you know, maybe white milk over chocolate milk, or if they had a water in their um, uh, lunchbox instead of juice. And then, uh, it, then it was a parent complained and said, well, I think that if they have anything healthy, they should get a sticker okay, I'm very open-minded. Let's try this. Um, and what happens when literally everybody else has something quote unquote healthy and they're uh, on their tray or lunchbox that this one child had a bag of chips, a bag of cookies and a juice. And, you know, I just, I was like, Hey, do you want to go get a glass of water from the water fountain? So, you know, then it was sort of alienating and I didn't want that. And then it just, it kind of the light bulb, like, Hey, kids eat the least amount of veggies it's the least subjective, it's the least controversial, and it has just been such a positive program on our campus um, this uh, year. So, and, and it's tied to free recess. It doesn't cost anything. So, sorry, I didn't go off on a tangent on that, but no, I- No, 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 but it's truly I, I love the fact that- and, mm -hmm. and getting parents to come up, they want to be back in the schools. They, they enjoy getting to see the kids. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, super way to increase that parent involvement in nutrition education. Yeah, and I, I have always loved that, especially now kind of the new added twist on recess, because um, look at that, we're, we're really promoting, um, you know, eating more fruits and vegetables and um, getting some extra time to be physically active outside. Yeah, um, yeah. You really can't go wrong with that. So good point. Anyone else have something uh, another nugget from either today or yesterday that they would love to to share? 
I was excited to hear Joel say that they're they're bringing, you know, hopefully still, you know, going to be revisiting the recess policy again, even though it's failed. Um, you know, fingers crossed there. But and, and I know they've got mental health as a top priority, which as it should be. So um, I was very motivated by his uh, legislative update. Alice. Yes, Tricia. I was really impressed with the different levels of information because we had the big picture with legislation and how some of this can be moved forward in the entire state. We have research information that we can pull for legislation as well as takeaways to go back to the individual school districts. And we had some wonderful nuggets for local district strategies. Mm. So I'm, I'm really motivated by the fact that we, we got to see more of the big picture and we are, are able to take home some data that we can use to mobilize our forces and on the local level. Mm. Excellent point, Tricia. Excellent point. Um, absolutely. It really is um, uh, kind of a three-pronged approach that uh, hopefully people are walking away with. Um, I also appreciated that um, we had uh, so many fantastic experts who were sharing um, new resources available, um, you know, some, some new free resources, whether it was yesterday with TEA talking about the mental health school toolbox or whether it was, um, you know, catch my breath today and, and all the other things in between. Uh, it, it was really fantastic to see that. And, and of course, I, I am a bit biased, but also that community connection and knowing that you have community partners like Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, like It's Time Texas, like, you know, so many other groups that are out, uh, Texas PTA, you know, where, where there are opportunities for all of us to get out of our silos, out of our um, uh, specific um, roads and try to find ways to, to partner and all of us pulling in that same direction will hopefully um, have, have the impact that we want to see. Um, so thank you to everybody who joined. So here is what I would like everyone to do, if you can, please um, complete our summit evaluation. And here is the, the QR code um, or the link. Um, it's really important. And I, I kind of started today um, a little bit with a recap. And, and I had mentioned to, to everyone, we really do value your input. This is very important for us as a steering committee. Um, we had showcased that we, we make up a number of organizations across the state. Um, and our membership, Texas Action for Healthy Kids membership, has actually topped 10,000 members this year. And so it's we want to know what are your thoughts about the conference, um, about um, the, uh, let me see if I can, oh, sorry. Somebody asked to put the link inside of um, the uh, text chat. So yes, let me see if I can do that real quick. Um, the, um, so we, we value your uh, thoughts and opinions and we want everyone to, to please, um, you know, let us know um, other issues that we should be um, looking into and that that um, we we want to try to cover if not with another summit with uh, our monthly webinars that we host um, we have um, oh thank you Karen for putting that inside of the the uh, chat so you know as we kind of round off the the day um, I want to to reiterate again the number of resources and and to just think of Texas Action for Healthy Kids as um, an umbrella. So we we try to work across all kinds of program areas, all in the goal of of improving school health and, and improving the health of our kids. Um, and so here is um, 
uh, a couple of the resources where you can certainly uh, come and see some of our past webinars. Um, also note that you will be receiving an email in the next couple of days that will have you know information to where you can see this recording as well as uh, access to any of the presentations by any of our experts who were uh, attending yesterday and today um, and uh, and we we look forward to hearing from everybody y'all can always reach out to us Again, follow us on any of the social media channels that we have so that you can um, get access to the resources. Um, and I, I'm just gonna pause and see if anybody has any other questions or comments. Okay, if not, um, thank y'all so much for attending today. And um, we look forward to seeing y'all again uh, on another one of our events. Um, here is the contact information for Mrs. Michelle Smith, who is our, our state coordinator and our senior field manager. Um, and I will also type in my um, uh, email address for everyone if you have any questions for me. Um, that I can assist anybody with. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Alice. You have a good rest of your week. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks so much, Angela. You were a wealth of information.
Alice. Alice, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I, I guess I'm just going to go ahead and leave. And um, I tried making to see if I could even stop the recording. I looked at it a couple of different ways and could not get the opportunity. I think that has to be done with Michelle's computer since she was the one who started it. Yeah, well, she said just leave it on. Um, Okay. I was able to put one in the waiting room and he's waiting. So I think we'll just X that out. Okay. I, yeah, I wasn't able to get anybody in a, a waiting room. I don't know why, or it didn't give me that option on my, at least not that I could see. Well, um, it yeah. gave it to me before and now it isn't. So yeah, I think I'm just going to go ahead and leave now, but I thought it was another great day. Lots of good information as usual. Yeah, yeah. Um, hopefully. Um, so did you, um, did Michelle send you an email or, or maybe it was a text um, about our um, debrief meeting? She said something about rescheduling it. I told her that Friday was not good for me because it's Hadley's grandparent day mm. and they start out with a nine o'clock mass so I I'd miss the whole thing well I, I think it, you. yeah it seemed like it was conflicting with a lot of people um that's also like right before the Thanksgiving break some school, right. some schools are doing you know, the programs and so forth. So um, the last that I recall, and, and the only reason I bring it up is because I wondered if you wouldn't mind sending out an email to everyone, um, just uh, telling them that uh, our, our talk summit debrief meeting um, has been postponed and we will just um, have a discussion about the summit, you know, at, people can write down thoughts or comments if they have any right now, but um, we'll just have it as a part of, yeah, as a part of our next monthly um, uh, meeting is what Michelle and I had talked about. We okay. said, well, maybe okay. we just, we just put that on the agenda and we'll spend the first 10 or 15 minutes and do a recap that way. Okay. I'll, yeah, I'll be, I'll do that right now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, Thanks, you have Sandy. a good weekend. I hope your mom's better and your trees get cut down. And <laughs> geez, and poor yeah. Michelle. I uh, know. No. Okay. Thank well, have you. a happy Thanksgiving. You too, if we don't talk before then. Okay. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye bye.